including honorable members, uh, our support staff, uh, members of the media, everybody who's on the platform, you are most welcome. Uh, today, we are meeting uh, <clears throat> to consider the division of revenue bill uh, with the members of, 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 the, of the public. As you would know that uh, when the Minister of, of Finance uh, presented his budget, amongst the bills that he presented was the Division of Revenue Bill. So our laws enjoins, enjoin us uh, to also involve the members of the, of the public as we, <clears throat> as, as we deal with these bills. This allows the members of the public an opportunity to reflect and input on the bill. So that's what we are, we are doing today. We are allowing the members of the public uh, to, uh, through their organizations, uh, to make their inputs as, as, as far as uh, the bill is concerned. But before we proceed, uh, Darren, can you please uh, 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 share with us if there are any apologies? Chairperson, I did not receive any apologies for today's meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Honorable Kaiso, do we, do we have uh, any new member that perhaps we need to, to, to welcome on the platform? Yes, good morning, Honorable Chair. We are expecting Honorable Humphrey Neneza to join us. I'm sure is uh, seem to join uh, the, the link has been sent to okay. as a new yeah um uh, you uh, Darren will indicate once a uh, uh, honor member is uh, it's it's uh, has, has, has joined so that we can properly welcome him uh, uh, to the committee right uh, <clears throat> Okay, thank, thank, thank you. Um, honorable members, uh, uh, allow me to welcome uh, Kosatu, Amanda Dotmobi, Rural Health Advocacy Project, TBA, uh, TB Accountability Consortium, Budget Justice Coalition, and Section uh, 27. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, for taking an opportunity to uh, interact with the with with the committee on 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 matters that you think are very important and matters that are, are affecting you directly or your constituencies, and we do uh, we do welcome uh, you are you are coming here. So the way we'll do it, uh, all members will allow each. Uh, <clears throat> a representative of the society, a, a 15 minutes input. And then after that, we'll, we'll, I'll be taking the next one. And then I'll request honorable members just to take down the, the issues that they would like to raise. So you, you, when you ask your question, you'll definitely be saying, uh, who are you directing your question to? Having said that, uh, let me uh, uh, request Kosatu to start. Uh, we've agreed that uh, it's a, it's a, we're giving each other 15 minutes uh, <clears throat> input, uh, and then you get an opportunity when you start ask, uh, replying to questions to elaborate on some of the issues that the, that, the mem that the members would like to follow up. Remember that we have also sent a, uh, uh, your presentations to us. So it's a question of emphasizing certain areas that you'd like to emphasize. Can I start with a uh, uh, Kosato? I take it that uh, uh, Comrade Metu Parks it's, uh, will be making a presentation. Um, good morning. Yeah, good morning to, to members. Um, yeah, let me just put our presentation up quickly. Um, and thanks as always for giving us space as Kosato just to. Um, to raise our viewpoints um, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, so Chair, we had to, and apologies from, from my side, we had to make some adjustments because we were chasing our 
provincial municipal structures, especially Samu, just to give us some of the latest stats, <clears throat> which I know members would always ask for about the situation in different municipalities. So um, we have emailed a revised edition late last night, but I'll just speak to it here. But it's not fundamental changes, but just some additional information for, for many members' uh, benefits. Um, Chair, I think just to kind of give a bit of context, context to the, our submission on the Division of Revenue Bill, obviously we are very sensitive to, to a very fragile uh, economy. Uh, we saw the, 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 the GDP shrinkage last quarter. And of course, you know, unemployment rate is still extremely dangerously high, uh, despite the positive <clears throat> reductions by 4% in unemployment last year. And of course, you know that many workers are, have lost wages, are highly indebted, including uh, municipal workers, public servants, etc. Uh, we've all been dealing with issues of load shedding, of cable theft, and the devastation inflicted upon a railway network. And of course, you see many entities, SOEs, um, in really real trouble. Um, Chair, you know, obviously, as a Dora bill, a door bill, um, we're very distressed by the rapid deterioration in municipalities, and of course, the issue of the pandemic of corruption uh, decimating the state. Chair, I think just on the we often disagree with, with government on the whole budget approach, and obviously it cascades to, to the Division of Revenue Bill. Um, we feel that we can't just simply focus on the issue of reducing debt levels. Yes, we agree we need to get the debt on a sustainable trajectory, uh, but it shouldn't be a, a sole focus of the interventions by government. Um, we have a GDP which is going to only grow by 0.9% this year, and that's not even taken into account uh, how much worse could load shedding and, uh, get. Um, we think we do need to focus in terms of the fiscal interventions about relief to the unemployed, about employment programs, about growing the economy, about rebuilding the state, SOEs, municipalities, uh, frontline public services, and of course, the issues of tackling uh, tax evasion, corruption. And we think if we do that, that will make it easier for the state to reduce the debt trajectory to a more sustainable uh, setting. Chair, we know that the, you know, obviously the heart of any government uh, revenue is always going to be the public service wage issue. Well, not to the heart, but a, a key component rather, uh, given that it's always about 35% of the budget. Um, and we feel that it has been stable 35% of the budget since 2008, and it had increased that time uh, because the government correctly employed additional key uh, skilled public servants, your, your doctors, your, your nurses, teachers, um, police officers and so forth. I think, Chair, that, you know, obviously problems not a collective bargaining forum, obviously, but I think as members would ask, I think our viewpoint as Kusat is that we do, we need to fix a broken relationship between the state as an employee and between public servants. Uh, we need to, to engage, we need all parties to engage with each other to find a win-win solution. Uh, one which doesn't, you know, collapse the fiscus, obviously, because that'll be known as interest, especially workers, but equally one that does protect um, public servants from seeing their wages being eroded by inflation, enables them to get out of, many of them are deep, deeply in debt, uh, having support relatives, et cetera, who have lost jobs. Um, you need to have a public service which is motivated and not demoralized. Or we need to avoid a, you know, sparking or spurring the brain drain of skilled public servants to the private sector to overseas, et cetera, especially nurses and doctors and teachers and so forth. We think there is space to, to assist government by moving towards a single public service wage regime uh, encompassing the broader state, <clears throat> seeing where we can reduce the packages on top to be to politicians, to senior management, et cetera. And I think Chair, there's also space, especially at a local government level, to do a physical headcount to try to eliminate ghost posts <clears throat> like we saw in Prasa not long ago. We do think Chair, that, you know, obviously keep out the door, door bill is that the infrastructure investments. And I think we must really appreciate the huge amount of injections government's putting on the table for infrastructure. Um, you know, it's 225 billion rand this year, cumulatively. But over the MTEF, it's about 903 billion rand uh, for rail, for roads, <clears throat> for housing, for student accommodation, for sanitation, water, energy, and ports. So we think that's really going to help spur the economy, um, especially the issues around transport and logistics, um, including for metro rail. But there's also Chair, there's a huge investment in water, which is, which is critical given our massive water infrastructure backlog. <clears throat> and after energy, water is our next, water rail is our next major crisis, as we can see um, in, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay and other parts of the, of the Karoo, etc. Of course, Chair, we are worried about the issues of implementation of corruption, of the construction site extortion we're seeing growing. 
And we think there is a need to also kind of designate additional items for local procurement, but I think the point is we need to move with speed around it. Share this on the local government front, <clears throat> which should be kind of the heart of our issues we will raise. It's quite alarming that we've seen in the last decade, 90% municipalities um, now in financial distress. That's a jump from 10% a decade ago. We're seeing about 27 municipalities uh, routinely failing to pay their staff, uh, transfer deductions like medical or pensions, or even to pay service providers, SMEs. Um, we see residents owing municipalities about 280 billion rand in electricity bills. And of course that spills over to local government, um, which owes ESCOM about 57 billion rand. And it's about, I think 40 municipalities owe the majority of that. <clears throat> We've seen many municipalities have failed to provide basic services or even indigent grants or subsidies. And of course, I think we've all seen, you know, many municipalities in rural areas like Lichtenberg, Frankfurt, et cetera, that companies are closing and retrenching as a consequence. And of course, local government really remains a, a epicenter of, of corruption in all provinces. But we didn't really get a sense chair in the doorbell. What exactly is interventions by COGTA to arrest this? We see some, you know, inventions, interventions here and there by Treasury, but not at the scale we think is going to get us out of this crisis. Not at the scale that's going to kind of put municipalities on a sustainable footing. Um, you know, to give one example, Chair, you have uh, to support a municipality in Northwest where the monthly expenditure is about 15 million rand. The revenue they collect as a municipality is about a million rand and the grants they get from the state is about 8 million rand. So they have a shortfall of about 50% each month. That obviously is not sustainable, no matter how you can bail them out. You need to find a new model, which might include consolidating municipalities to district municipalities. Chair, just going to provinces, um, and we've just have highlighted um, that you know, you'll see significant cuts um, over the medium term expenditure framework to quite a few municipalities. So in the Eastern Cape, you see Bayes, Nordia, Blue Cream, um, Makana, Makuma, Mklaba, I mean, quite a few municipalities across, um, especially in the Krishani district, but across many other districts as well. Uh, many of these municipalities are really struggling. Um, Enoch in, in, in Kijima, Chair, would have seen there's huge problems there around service delivery and protest. Um, we've seen below MTEF, well, below CPI allocations over the MTEF period, again, to about another dozen municipalities across the Eastern Cape. Again, some like Point St. John's <clears throat> in Tabunkolu um, had been a real crisis. Um, Winnie Matike, Matike Zella Mandela as well. And we're not sure, Chair, if we're going to be cutting how we're going to help these very poor rural municipalities get out of the crisis, address basic services, et cetera. But having said that, Chair, we have seen positive increases to a few municipalities. Nkhuba um, Yatema, Joe Krabi, King Dalin Jabo, or Atamba District. Now, Chair, you will see a bit of cross correlation between municipalities where there's some cuts and those who fail to pay workers. But again, we have Amatoli, Amatlata, the usual suspects. Um, and again, yeah, now you see Raymond Mplava, Inok, Nkijima, King Dalin Jabo. And again, these are some of the ones which had cuts. Though with King Dalin Jabo, there was a positive increase. On the Free State Chair, Again, there's cuts to the Kharib district and Solopele, Mafube, uh, below CPI increases to let's say Koponong. Um, but we have seen some positive increases to, to about four municipalities, some of which have been perpetually in the headlines, uh, like Machabang, Ngwade, uh, Matsimoholo. We hope that's going to help them. <clears throat> but again, Chair, the Free State has really been the epicenter of the collapse of local government. Uh, we hope the new premier will be able to turn things around. But we see the, perpetually about seven municipalities, you know, and again, some of these ones are having cuts to them or below CPI increases, where they just simply struggle to pay for the staff. I think one of them, Chair, we feel is really in a complete a free fall, which is Malutia Pafong, where the previous deputy president had himself tried to intervene on that front. Um, Chair, um, we've seen cuts to, to Midvall and West Rand, uh, but there is positive, you know, significant increases to, to Joburg, Chwane, and some of the other cities, which I hope will help them. Um, we only see one municipality which is failing to pay workers in Khartoum, which is Mfuleni. <clears throat> KZN Chair, there's a huge, <laughs> huge amount of municipalities, perhaps because of the size of the population, where you see MTF cuts. It's about, it's more than a dozen. And again, very poor areas, many of them really struggling with basic services and so forth. Uh, we've seen below MTF increases, Again, for quite a few poor municipalities. Um, again, many of them really struggling, you know, Richmond, Pongola, et cetera, to, to provide basic services. But having said that, we have seen quite a few 
municipalities with, which have gotten significant increases, especially at a district level um, across KZN. We haven't heard reports of municipalities in KZN not paying the staff, so that's a positive um, indication. Um, Limpopo, again, we've seen you know, cuts to a few municipalities, Maruleng, Bloberg, and so on. Uh, below increases to Guiani, Lataba, Palabora, um, and so forth. But I think, again, there's been quite a few which have seen significant increases, which is welcome, like Zani, Mopani, Vembe, Polakwani, Tabazimbi. Many of these are in the kind of the economic development zones. Um, and there's about three municipalities which haven't paid, which are owing workers' money. And I think that's largely because of the merge of these municipalities um, and having to kind of equalize uh, the staff uh, pay scale. Hopefully that will be addressed. Um, and Pumalanga Chair, I think there's again some warning cuts again to some very weak municipalities like Steve Chwete, Hani, and so forth. Uh, below increases, below CPI increases for Lekwa, Chief Lutuli. But I think there is quite a few, um, a majority which have seen positive increases. So that's welcome. And hopefully that'll help to turn Pumalanga around. And surprisingly, Chair, we were told there are no municipalities in Pumalanga which are owing the staff. So that's positive. Um, in the Northern Cape Frontier, again, quite a few very, very poor uh, remote or rural municipalities which have received cuts. Um, quite a few which have got below CPI increases. And some of these municipalities, Chair, the budgets are really minuscule. So any cut to them has a huge impact. Uh, but we can see a few with some positive increases. And I think especially Saul Plaki, the significant injection, injection for water infrastructure. And I think uh, members who know the chair of the wall in Kimberley would, would uh, welcome this as a positive injection. And again, Chair, we've got about five municipalities in Northern Cape, which continuously fail to pay the staff. Um, some of which um, have experienced strikes like Tembelikle, which is your hope town area. Um, in Northwest Chair, again, some worrying cuts to some of these rural municipalities, which have really struggled. But I think you can see at a majority of instances, uh, positive increases for quite a few uh, really struggling municipalities. Um, we hope that's going to help turn things around, like it, it's a bottler, et cetera. And again, you've got about five municipalities, six actually, um, including Mahikeng, which are routinely failing to pay municipal employees on time. Um, the last province uh, chair is about Western Cape. Um, you know, some cuts to, to some municipalities in the Overberg and the, in the Karoo, which is a little bit worrying given the state of the economy in the Karoo. Um, I think there is positive increases for Cape Town, which obviously is a migration center. center. And I know a huge injection for Drakenstein for water infrastructure and for Kanaland. Obviously, around Kanaland, we know that's the perpetual crisis point of the Western Cape, where hope is going to come with some management intervention from the provincial government. And um, of course, we must acknowledge Western Cape uh, has not had any issues of paying workers, um, et cetera. And just share the last two kind of slides around the departmental grants to provincial local government around basic education. We are worried about over the MTEF about cuts to infrastructure and that on the infrastructure backlog allocations, only Eastern Cape, KZN, and Limpopo received funding, and there was about 15% unallocated. Um, we are quite worried about the plans to phase out according to the budget. We hope it won't happen. The Presidential Employment Initiative, which has really helped the education um, department to employ teaching assistants, and that's been at around 6 billion Rand for the past two years. But there's a plan to end it next year. So we hope that will be funded and we will not see it ending next year. But I think Chair, we must really appreciate the significant allocations to early childhood development. And that's a positive injection to, to education. Um, on the similar point as a presidential plumbing stimulus, we are worried that under Treasury, we're again seemingly ending the neighborhood development grant next year. We hope that won't happen. There will be an allocation. Um, there is quite positive allocations in infrastructure for roads and public transport networks. Um, there's positive increases for urban settlements development, but there's below CI increases for housing grants and for informal settlement upgrades. And again, the level of migration that wouldn't make sense for us. Uh, but we do want to appreciate the positive increases for regional bulk infrastructure for water. And that really is a significant uh, change. Then Chair, just on the DMRE electricity front, I mean, given our load shedding crisis and the need to kind of save or reduce demand efficiently, um, to assist to support ESCOM is quite worrying that they're below MTEF, below CPI increases for the energy and efficiency and demand side management. Um, there's only CPI linked increases for the integrated national electric, electrification program. And you'll find that these are not in all municipalities. It's, it's literally on average about 
one or two or three per district or per province. And that is quite worrying given the electricity crisis is a national uh, calamity. So I think in conclusion, Chair, I think for us it's about now, we have the budget, it's about holding departments accountable. Obviously parliament has a key role. We must also try to do our bit as COSATU. We really hope not to see a rollover like 17 billion rand like previous financial years. Um, we do think Chair, there is a need to for next year to extend the presidential employment initiative and in fact to increase it and not to, to decrease it as we saw in this year's budget. And then lastly, Chair, you know, elections are in 14 months, give or take. Um, we don't have the luxury of time. We really need to see government with a great speed to rebuild local government and to kind of get the state back on its feet if we do uh, rebuild public services and to really grow the economy and protect uh, the uh, workers' interests, et cetera. So let me stop there, Chair, and I think I might've gone one minute over uh, beyond, but apologies for that, Honorable Chair, thanks. No, you, you, <clears throat> you were spot on. Thank you very much, my, my um, uh, stopwatch. Is it's 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 on. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, uh, uh, comrade uh, Minty Parks, uh, uh, Amanda Dotmobi. Please introduce yourself, and uh, 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 we have got fifteen minutes. Thank you so much, Amanda Dotmobi. Thank you, honourable chair, and good morning. Um, I'm Joseph Opa, and I'm a campaigner at Amanda Dotmobi. Chair, please allow me just a moment to share my screen. Thank you. Uh, this is our presentation. Miss Mrs. Siop, let's see you just show yourself and then you. Uh, okay. Okay. Let me do this. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, Chair. How are you? Good, good. Welcome again. So, yeah, you can Thank see you. Are. Thank you. Dear yeah, members of the Select and Standing Committee on Appropriations, the 2023 budget tabled by Finance Minister Ino Kodongwana breaks promises made by President Ramaphosa in his sauna. This budget leaves millions behind in poverty by keeping the rich rich and the poor poor. Our biggest issue with this budget is that it does not cater for the poor majority and instead provides relief for the rich. As an organization with a constituency of nearly a million people, the majority living in low income backgrounds, we have constantly made our demands clear with proposals on how to find revenue to help lift millions out of poverty by taxing the rich more. Each month, with thousands of social grant recipients and those facing challenges receiving social grants. Ahead of the budget, over 4,000 budget tips were submitted to National Treasury, calling on Finance Minister Kodongwana to increase all grants by 500. We welcome the increases on social grants. However, honorable members, the increases are still not enough. While an additional 30 billion rand allocation for social grants may sound like a lot of money, food inflation basically cancels these social grant increases. The grant increases are not adequate to bandage the high cost of living that many households are unable to keep up with. This is Tandi. She went grocery shopping for her two children with the child grant support money. Out of everything she needed, she had to choose one over the other because the money was simply not enough. On top of that, she still has to get her kids to school and get them other basic necessities. The groceries she bought would not even last for two weeks. Now imagine what happened to a pensioner who has to take care of an entire household with a grant money. Yet in parliament, people celebrated when the grant increases were announced. The people who celebrated are people who have salaries of probably more than a million per annum. But pensioners like Gogos continue to go through this heartbreaking situation. Pensioners have made their demand to increase their grant to 2,500 rand. As always, we will let the Gogos speak for themselves. And being an parliament, Navatazi, Bismarck, Gia Kalala, Wabataza is mad. Gia Kalala, Hamrapant, 
Ugoti inda batina si njalo swagole imali ngani inga zo siza ngaluchi. Otwa awa pezu bamba ngagoko mtabaya pumele na tina bokoko. Aisane lisli imali ingani koba ni ingani aisebe nzi nabazu ulmafu ndanje kotwa aguku pumele lukutibatole imsebe nzi. Sia fundi isa tenza konki ugusha kia kupuge tolu. Koti malie yo koko haifa wangu kufana. Luhandro trani au zuhusi sandawu. Ongno musisi ndawu siya kala nje njalu. Siya kala mpela ngali imali. Sela abata asbizi madi. Mas taba ngele. Kisi kala sisi sife. Ya bingelela i parlamende lezi madi. Mina ika mela mgingu koku togo ngubani. Anganeli siwe. Ile mali eskushulelu yona. Au ngangbangali sile, genyango juli si chole yona le mali, ya setu su hundre shran gathiga ase. Kote ya shugani su ngo oktober stola uten randi pele u hundre shran. Ainga neli sile nagangani le mali. Aiwenzu umesu uti nabandu abasu pegae. Uteme kipa le sabo ilo sezmali, lama mahola kakula zanga ba teks. Ushuguti la e South Africa, umundo shupegayo, yosale kinelezi legenzali. Uti la baba abangase, abacheso kanangona bebebeni male kukuzwe skwazu tigli mali, si kushulelo ili mali. Honorable members, it saddens us that the 350 grant was not increased to match inflation. The budget cut for the 350 grant will see a million people excluded from the grant. I'm not happy in how things turned out because I was expecting that 350 grant will be increased as we went to March in submitting memorandums. You know. So I'm not happy at all as it does not meet monthly needs of so 350 divided by 20 days is 11 rand and some cents. So it's not enough. Even bread doesn't cost 11 rand. It's more than that. So how do they expect people to live on 11 rand every day with 350? And also in concerning 350, some people are not even because they are approved with no paid days. They should fix their system also. And and again, 350 should turn should be turned into a basic income grant because people use them for their survival. Some do not work, jobs are scarce, and people cannot go to work every day because nobody wants to hire them. So basic income grant would be a great idea if the government will implement it instead of extending it every year. They should just consider making it permanent and compulsory for people 18 to 59 years. So I'm not happy in how things turned out because every other grant was increased except 350s. Why is that? Recording stopped. I'm not happy at all about the budget, the budget speech that's taken place on the 22 of February 2023. Since when the government knew that we laid our complaint, we went to match it to complain about the 350 grant that we wanted to return to a basic income fund, which we can't afford like people's needs three times per day. So we demanded that the government can raise 350 grant to 650 at least, so that people can be able to afford their monthly, their monthly meals. So the government does not take us to us. It is also disappointing that the issues with the 350 grant are still not fixed, and more concerning that it is continuing as though it is functioning properly when we all know that it is not. My administration has seen those who qualify for the grant struggling and unfair relations resulting in millions who qualify for the grant declined for it. It is saddening that little has been done to fix all those issues.
We have previously asked this committee to hold SASA and BSD accountable for their failures. Can this committee tell us what it has done to fix all issues with the 350 grant? Has this committee consulted SASA and BSD at all? Over the past few months, similar issues with the 350 grant seem to have extended to other social grants as well. The closure of post offices has left grant recipients such as pensioners stranded after traveling long distances to access their grant money. In some cases in rural areas, goggers have to travel long distances just to get their grant, but the closure of post offices and some Sasa branches had them traveling back home empty handed. In December 2022, glitches in the social grant system left mothers stranded in supermarkets trying to buy food for their children. Cards. Just last week, we received multiple reports that the child grant was not paid on time and people had to ring the alarm before they could get any communication from SASA or DSD. Honorable members, this is unacceptable, especially because we know this government is capable of ensuring that things work as they are supposed to. We have seen it before. The deteriorating service for millions who rely on the grant system to access cash is failing people, and to witness it is heartbreak. The budget is taxes and allocations. We were told by your colleagues at the Joint Finance Committee that we must not come to their public hearings and talk about social grant amounts, and that we should stick to the revenue proposals. They said this committee, the appropriations, would be the ones to deal with social grants. So here we are talking to you about social grants not being increased enough. You will probably tell us there is not enough money to increase social grants. You can have issues. If the majority of members of parliament stand by like they stood with state capture and allow treasury and the finance minister to pass budgets that cut social spending because you fail to raise enough revenue, people's anger towards you will continue to grow. We hear stories of how mothers won't eat so that there is enough food for their children because the child support grant is not enough. Treasury knows the social grant increases are not enough, but it appears the finance minister and treasury were more concerned about the impact of tax on those who love their Norwegian salmon from Woolworths, salmon that costs nearly as the 350 grant someone has to survive on for a whole month. Our campaign to tax the rich has mass support our campaign called for an increase of personal income tax on those earning over 1 million rand. It happens that each committee member here knows very well what paying a bit more tax would mean since each of you earn a salary of over 1 million rand. Would any here go to bed hungry if they paid a bit more tax? The finance minister believes you can't afford to pay a bit more tax, but where is the evidence? Do you even know how much a loaf of bread costs? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm putting it on a boot. It's too expensive. I haven't a clue. I just buy bread because we need it. <laughs> I really haven't a clue what the bread price is. I think it's about five or six rand. I'm not sure. <laughs> a loaf of bread at the moment? That is a good question. <laughs> Cost wise? Gosh, I have no idea. The clip you just watched is about 10 years old from a documentary called Crumbs, which is about how food companies like Tiger Brands and Pioneer Foods colluded to increase the price of bread. At the moment, a loaf of bread costs around 15 rand. The point is, extreme inequality requires real action. For the sake of making sure people can live with dignity, would taxing the rich more be that devastating? The fact that people were cheering when the finance minister announced that there won't be an increase in taxes on those who can afford to pay more tax is concerning. There is a cost of living crisis for the poor majority. There is a health crisis and an education crisis. Yet there was that celebration. President Ramaphosa claims a basic income grant is being worked on. To turn the 350 SRD grant into a basic income grant, surely it is worth paying a bit more tax. Even if it means instead of that BMW that costs 2 million rand, someone has to settle for a Toyota Corolla instead. I am pleading to Minister Kodongwana to please fight corruption, increase the tax of the rich, give more than 250 to all caregivers. Honorable members, we are not economists nor experts, but there is research and proposals by different economists on how to implement 
a wealth tax. The Davis Tax Committee recommended gathering data on assets and liabilities, which SARS has already started. This data can be used to design and implement a wealth tax, which could help increase social grants and help fund the basic income grant. We acknowledge the hard work of SARS to turn things around and improve compliance, including targeting offshore revenue estimated at 400 billion rand. More must be done to help SARS continue their important work to address non-compliance but also elicit financial flows. Each of you is here to serve the people, especially the poor majority. If you are committed to this, you need to go talk to your colleagues at the finance committees and your fellow party members and stop Treasury and the finance minister from delivering budgets that allow the poor to get poorer and the rich to get richer. There is immense wealth in our country, but if the pie keeps getting smaller, the price to find money will keep increasing. Of parliament stood in solidarity with the poor majority and gave half their salaries away, an extra 40,000 people would be able to access the 350 grant each month. Honorable members, it has become a common thing to pit grants and jobs against each other. We need both. The finance minister in October last year had planned on pitting grants against one another by stating that extending the 350 grant would mean other social grants would not be increased as much. The finance minister and treasury always talk about fiscal constraints when it comes to social grants, Mr. but that Mr. word doesn't apply to other areas of the budget. The ministerial Mrs. Siopa, you are on injury time, big injury time. Please wrap up. It's almost over. Okay, sorry, my apologies all those driving luxury cars. Honorable members, this budget fails to help the poor majority find or create jobs because it fails to increase those who can afford to pay more. All of your political parties have made countless promises about creating jobs, but increasing social grants significantly and introducing a basic income grant would help millions travel to job interviews or start their own businesses. Social grants help local and informal economies in low-income communities. I will end it there, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Amanda Dotmobi, uh, Mr. Siopa. Uh, can we, we have rural health advocacy project? 15 minutes, please. And please introduce yourselves and let's uh, see who are, who are talking to. Thank you. Rural health advocacy project. Good morning, honorable chairs and honorable members. Uh, my name is Russell Rensberg. I work at the Rural Health Advocacy Project as a director. I think, I mean, maybe if, if our presentation can be loaded on that side, um, honorable chair. No, we can't see it. Uh, we see you now. Try to flat, right? I think we, we sent the presentation ahead of time. So I was wondering whether the committee secretary can load the presentation or, or do I need to load it on our own? Darren? Chairperson, I've met Mr. Rensberg, a co host, so he can load from his side. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Look, in, in short, um, Honorable Chair, our, our many of us have already gone ahead and given all the technical aspects around what the budget does and what the budget doesn't do. You know, where the cuts are, and I'm sure the Honorable Members are very aware of it. I think it's a rural health advocacy project. Um, our role really or, or our function is to promote, protect, and advance the right to health of rural communities. Right? That is our mission and, and the work that we do. And we view the division of revenue really just as, as assessing the extent to which it advances the lives or the healthcare rights of rural communities. Now, I don't think I have to do this that the constitution is the highest. Um, govern, um, a law in the country, and it's a, and, and essentially what it is is something that all laws should be viewed through, including the, the Money Bills Amendment Act that you are sitting and presiding over at the moment. So I think coming out of probably the, the biggest crisis that we've had in the century, you know, it's not hard, and it doesn't take a genius so that quality has deepened. And I'd like to remind honorable members of, of, of the claim that we make in our constitution or the aspirations that we make about creating a better life for all. Right. 
Mr. Rensbeck, um, switch off your video, we are losing you. Mr. Rensbeck, um, uh, Darren, can you please uh, call Mr. Rensbeck and just... Erin? Chairperson, we've um, lost Mr. Mr. Rensburg. I'm trying to call him, um, but he's no longer on the on the on the platform chair. Okay. I think what what we 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 must do, just just call him and, and tell him that uh, um um we'll 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 we'll, <clears throat> we'll reconnect him. Uh, I think in the meantime, let's take a TB Accountability Consortium. Okay. Let's introduce you. Uh, Mr. Rensbeck. Sorry, Honorable Chair. I think, you know, we just had some connectivity issues here. Yeah. You know, one of the indirect consequences of load shipping. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr. Rensbeck. Our connectivity. Helps. Mr. Rensbeck, yes. can you switch off your video yeah. and, and let's see whether we can improve connectivity? Switch off your video. Thank you, Honorable Chief. Um, thank you for your patience. I will switch the video off. And like, I think that in the main, um, our presentation, like I said, um, really just focuses on some of the responsibilities we think that Parliament has in guiding us through probably what's going to be the most difficult to recovery in our history as a democracy. You know, we've seen one of the things that we're particularly concerned about is that, you know, the majority of health services, and particularly rural health services, are delivered through provincial health budgets. You know, there, are, there is some stuff um, with respect to um, conditional grants and the like, but the bulk of healthcare services are funded through the conditional grant, through the provincial equitable share. And for the next calendar year, there's a sharp drop in funding for at the, at, at, the, at the provincial equitable share level. Then when we look at the health um, component, you know, while we've made some revisions to healthcare, or uh, the healthcare component that are rural friendly, and we really appreciate for the work that's been done around that. When you look at the broader conditions the many of our provincial administration running deficits through the holding, withholding of invoices, and I think in the 2020, 20, 21, 2022 financial year, the Auditor General Take those um, unfunded commitments or accruals and over 15 billion rand across the country. You know, so I think our, our, our provincial administrations are really struggling to meet the expectations. And I think the balance and the way that we are currently funding healthcare needs some revision. And, I, and I'd like the members to really consider section 214 of the constitution, subsection 2H to J, where members are obliged to consider the obligations of the provinces and municipalities in terms of national legislation. So national legislation here would include obviously the constitution and the extent to which those budgets sufficiently mitigate the impact of any crises on the broader realization of rights. The second thing is to look at the desirability and the stability and predictability of allocations of revenue shares. Are we allocating in a manner that really advances our aims as a constitutional democracy? Are we making any particular adjustments to ensure that we do consider some of the things that our colleagues at Amandler and Novi mentioned, where the bulk of our population in rural areas are reliant on support from the state. And then thirdly, in section J of section, of section 214 of the constitution, they talk about the need for flexibility in responding to emergency or other temporary needs and other factors based on similar objective criteria. And I think my question to you, honorable members, is as the main political office bearers tasked with ensuring that our constitution is implemented. Are we at a time where we can continue with the business as usual processes, where we are told we have to wait for economic growth or the limitations to what public spending is? Or should we start having a conversation with our provincial counterparts and office barriers on the extent to which we can cushion the poor from the cuts in the public sector? You know, over the last week, 
uh, honorable members would have noticed that many of the workers have gone on strike, particularly in the Hau, which had a direct impact on the accessibility of healthcare services for communities that rely on them. And we consistently have this notion of having workers put it against the users, but we need to have some consideration of these different challenges that provinces face to ensure that at the very least we meet our obligations as contained within the National Health Act and Section 27 of the Constitution. And in terms of the National Health Act, you know, part of what the, the department needs to commit to or what we need to hold him to account to is to endeavor to protect, promote, and improve and maintain the health of the population, not of some. You know, currently most of our spending is happening at the hospital level. And as those costs increase, less and less money gets available for private to address some of the multiple epidemics that people are facing at that point. We've had a total drop in, 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 in vaccinations of, of, of children. We've had some challenges with the TB recovery plan where we, are, we won't have enough funding to be able to meet the targets that we've set ourselves. Um, on our HIV and AIDS grant, we've cut that grant and we cite some cost savings, but those cost savings aren't made clear to the general population. And we have to kind of wonder, what the plan is for the expansion of access to HIV and AIDS treatment now that we are so close to eradicating HIV as a public health threat. We also have to start talking about prioritization. And I think our recommendations as included is based really on, on looking at, at things in a three-way kind of process. The first is to look and understand the extent to which we are making decisions based on the information that we have available. South Africa has probably some of the most extensive health management information systems. We publish the district health barometer every year, which goes down to the district level in terms of how we're progressing on some of the major um, health priorities like maternal and child health, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases. And we are able to track more or less which regions are doing well and which are not. But we don't use that information to inform how we utilize the really limited health funding that we have. Right, And I think one of the measures that we need to do is to really start a conversation to find out, are we using the money that we have allocated to healthcare in the best possible way? I understand the limitations that Parliament faces and many of our provinces in terms of available funding. But I think given the history of our country and that 80% of the population is almost completely reliant on public services, that we have to start a conversation and how do we best use the money that we do have available to ensure that the worst, of, particularly those in rural areas, have their health rights prioritized and their population health improved. We also have to look at the health workforce. You know, every other day we hear about the massive staff shortages across the system. But I think what we need to do is probably have something similar to what we did in 2019, where we had all the provinces come through to parliament to, uh, and discuss some of these challenges in a joint sitting between the, the, the Standing Committee of Appropriations, the Standing Committee of Finance, and the Health Committee to take the nation into its confidence and to really share with us some of the challenges that we face so that we can start working together to ensure that as our fortunes decline over the next five years and our recovery will be slow, that at the very least, we maintain our obligations in respect of the Constitution. So I'll close with, with, with my recommendations, right? And all I'm saying is that really we have to make fair choices in the way that we allocate funding. We must, our healthcare needs will always exceed the available resources. And one of the ways to ensure that we meet, meet the obligations within our health act and within our, uh, our constitution is ensure that everybody has access to primary health care services. And I think part of that is by starting at looking at those populations that have the lowest coverage on some of the key disease priorities, and often those are the rural areas. So we're talking here about things like access to maternal and child health services, including sexual and reproductive health care. When last we spoke, um, our colleagues at the Czechs had done a survey of health over 100 facilities across the country. And one of the things that they found consistently was that women were not able to access they preferred contraceptions medicines because it was out of stock. Right? One of the things that we knew in Parliament to ensure is that provinces at the very least are making sure that people are able to access even those basic rights, which at the moment seems to be pushed down a lot. Secondly, we need to hold decision makers accountable to justify their decisions. 
you know, so it would be good if we could get a sense of provincial administrators coming through to parliament and sharing with them how are they dealing with some of the challenges in the government? How are they ensuring that the way that they allocate money is really in line with progressively realizing the rights to health of rural communities and other, other underserved populations? And what are the plans that they have time. to ensure and then, and I suppose our, our final thing is that we have to look at cost savings. Centralized procurements have been approved to, to deliver better efficiency in the supply and distributions of medicines. We'll know that in 2010, when we did the new HIV tender, we were able to substantively as a country reduce of the cost of ARV medication to the point that now over 5 million people are carrying on treatment. I think we have to establish minimum budget thresholds in consult consultation with the various provincial administrations, we have to go back to that notion of what are the non-negotiable expenditures and what is the minimum threshold of money that needs to be available to ensure that those services are cons consistently available. I think we need to begin with our additional grants. I know our colleagues from uh, the FFC have recommended that we start looking at different ways of doing grants, but grants are an essential component to deal with national priorities. What, what is lacking at the moment, though, is that we don't have any insight into these business plans, nor do we know the extent to which the conditions that attach those grants are effectively enforced. Finally, we have to prioritize compliance and governance across the system, right? Governance isn't merely just about ensuring that we don't corrupt. Governance is also about making sure that we get maximum value for the investments we're making. And I think finally, our, our point is really just the investment in leadership. Right, leadership across the system. And, and we would even go so as far to say that we need a dialogue on public sector leadership. What does it mean to lead our hospitals? What does it mean to lead our provincial administrations or HODs? And how do we start a national conversation of really start looking at the next five years as a manner of, manner of reversing some of the misguided um, decisions we may have made and the abuse of our administration? Over the last, I mean, just looking at fruitless or, or irregular expenditure, from 2014, we've seen a significant rise in poor management practices resulting in irregular expenditure. Having that number, according to the Auditor General in 2010, reach as much as 60 billion rand. So we're not a poor country by any stretch of the imagination, but sadly our inequality remains deep and we need political leadership to guide us on a national conversation that this country really is about working on a path for a better life for all. People are the ones that are the poorest and the most vulnerable and the vast majority of them live in rural areas. Thank you so much for your time and, and I, being appreciative of my technology challenges. Our presentation is available to the members and we as the Rural Health Advocacy Project are available to engage with you and listen to how we can support any measures that Parliament may, may take in showing the political leadership needed at this time to address some of the challenges we expect to face. We can no longer bury our heads in the sand. Thank you, over. Thank, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rensbeck, on behalf of a Rural Health Advocacy Project. Uh, let's go to TB Accountability Consortium. Uh, please introduce yourselves and uh, just show your face so that you can see who we are talking to. And uh, please uh, try to stick to 15 minutes in your presentation. As I said, that uh, these uh, uh, presentations have been shared with us. So it's a question of emphasis on certain areas. TB Accountability Consortium. Yes, Honorable Chair, good morning, and good morning to the other Honorable Members. My name is Sihema Hongandawonde, and I'm the Project Officer at the TV Accountability Consortium. Um, may I switch off my camera, please? Thank you so much. Um, our submission by the TV Accountability Consortium to the Select Committee on Appropriations is titled The Resilience of the TV Recovery Plan. TUBAC's purpose in the promotion of accountability and transparency in the allocation, distribution, and expenditure at national and provincial level. It is a project that seeks on increasing, connecting, and communicating existing efforts in realizing improved TB program performances. The project seeks in evaluating the role of accountability within health systems reform at financial performance and political accountability frameworks. 
how this is made manifest is in the support of the TV program interventions, such as the TV recovery plan, the national TV program strategic plan, as well as the SANAC led national strategic plan. And within these you know, strategies are the objectives in monitoring input on budget allocations and processes linked to the TV program, tracking provincial TV program implementation, as well as strengthening accountability within district level processes. This is where the fruits of the programs and the program interventions that we have really happen. The central premise of the submission is on the TB recovery plan, which is a transitory plan that was established to recover post COVID losses, where between 2019 and 2020, TB testing decreased by 23% nationally, laboratory diagnosis by 25%, and below half of known TB cases were successfully treated in 2020. This was the first time since 2005 where there has been an increase of TB deaths in our country. And this plan has been led by the Department of Health in setting out improved case findings through implementation of, of targeted universal testing in communities, strengthening linkage to care for people diagnosed with TB, strengthening retention in care for people diagnosed with TB, as well as strengthening TB prevention efforts. The national TV program is responsible for the coordination of the implementation of this program, and it is located within program three of the national expenditure estimates that you can see highlighted in slide three in yellow. Over the medium term of this national expenditures, we see that the budget um, we see that the program budget remains stagnant with a 0.01% increase. And despite the required coordination of the, of the implementation of the recovery and the launch of this new national TV program strategic plan is expected in the coming weeks. As part of the 2021 Stop TB Partnership, a report by the USAID on our TB program governance benchmarks. It found areas of underperformance in governance within categories such as program efficiencies and effectiveness, long approval and turnaround times in program processing, and poor TB program management empowerment, with no available um, data on absorption of funds from all sources. Such findings reflect on the lack of transparency on the already allocated budget. And in addition, bringing uncertainty onto how the provision of the TB recovery plan is being fleshed out, seeing that it is still a focal point in the TB program objectives. Um, my apologies. In slide four, we now go into the grant that mainly funds the TB activities, which is the District Health Program Grant, which has been renamed the HIV, TB, Malaria and Community Outreach Grant and forms the, cumul the cumulative amount. And this grant forms the, the strategic goal of the implementation of the NSP. The grouping of TB with HIV AIDS, as with other program interventions, further complicates budget planning and expenditure tracking. And since there is going to be a cut within this grant in the current financial year of the allocation of 84.3 billion rand, there is a lack of clarity in the prioritization of these provincial provisions for the TB recovery plan. And we see the same within the graph of the NSP 2023-2028 costing provisions that echo similar sentiments of the lack of availability of resourcing in being included within the HIV AIDS and STI programs. Now, how is the division of the provincial equitable share posing a danger to this recovery plan? Well, the health components makes up 27% of this equitable share, of which TB services are primarily funded through it. And the largest cost of this is HR or employment of the workers. And no consideration has been given for the public sector wage increases, as well as other inflation dependent um, factors. According to the National Treasury via Stats ASA, we see transfers to provinces declining in, in the year 2023-2024, before rising by an average of 2% in the outer years after adjustment. Concerning this program intervention, the TB recovery plan necessitates a sharp increase in testing, increased enrollment into care, which will, which will require additional spending on testing and medicines. 
Amidst uncertainty on future funding flows, it is essential that Parliament considers how existing publicly funded health care capacity is optimized and is prioritized within those with the greatest need. We see TB affecting a disproportionately higher amount of those who are poor. And so going into TBAC's recommendations for the Standing Committee is understanding the central premise of Section 27's right to health, where equitable functional mechanisms design and implementation of programs is secured and protected, that health services are a functional area in which national and provincial government share legislative com um, competence. And we refer to chapters one and nine of the National Health Act, which compile the provision of, pri of primary health care and the eligibility of free public health services. The National Department must facilitate and coordinate the establishment and, and maintenance of these provisional um, departments, district health councils, etc. We need to recognize that a transitory plan requires a transitory fiscal intervention, and Parliament has a responsibility that division of revenue and individual budget votes prioritize these services. Lastly, the Joint Committee, we recommend that the Joint Committee is to set up temporarily to review and interrogate provincial departments' resource allocations for the decisions of the years 2023, 24, and 25. Safeguarding these strategies um, must be put in place to ensure that the priority health services like TB and its recovery plan are protected. Without explicit protection and prioritization of primary health care services such as TB, could sadly result in increased and avoidable deaths. Ultimately, good governance requires good data and continued surveillance of TB data in these two separate structures will maintain low linkage to care and completion of the TB cascade. We would want to permit the comparison of NIC data with facility level data in effective assessment of, these, of those receiving treatment. Ultimately, our plea is an understanding that there needs to be a bilateral understanding of physical and programmatic understanding of TB, especially within the implementation of the TB recovery plan in the provincial levels. Um, honorable Chair, honorable members, thank you so, so much. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, uh, 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 Ms. Sihe. Uh, Mahonga Ndawonde uh, from TB Accountability Consortium. Um, can we then uh, 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 jump to budget coordinate? Please introduce, show, show your face, introduce yourself or yourselves, and then uh, you have got 15 minutes. Uh, greetings, honorable chair and honorable members. Um, and Thanks for everyone for showing up. Um, my name is Andile Zulu. Yeah. TB accountability, please uh, take down your, 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 your presentation. So that- uh, we, we... So sorry, my apologies. No problem. Uh, uh, yeah. Honorable Chairs, is it fine if I continue? Yes, please, you can proceed. All right, thank you so much. Um, my name is Andile Zulu from the Budget Justice Coalition. I will be making our submission to the committee alongside my colleague, Elroy Paulus. Um, if it is okay with the chair, I would like to begin sharing my screen. Do that, please.
So as the Budget Justice Coalition, our priority and our central objective is to enhance the process of democracy as it relates to coming up with a budget that citizens can participate in meaningfully alongside helping citizens craft a budget which not only meets their needs within the guidelines of the constitution, but which also pursues social justice and which also pursues environmental justice. And as some members of the committee will know, the BJC consists of a variety of civil society organizations within this um, uh, endeavor. So then moving down into the central priorities of this submission then, the BJC is of the view that the state has failed to justify the continuous implementation of budget cuts in efforts to reduce public borrowing. So we very much see this as a policy that is not produced by necessity, but a policy that reflects certain political choices. Um, and so in line with our objectives of the BJC, we also promote uh, and heighten the call for participatory human rights impact assessments of spending allocations to public services um, in the efforts to protect these services. And of course, we also submit that the budget disproportionately impacts marginalized communities, specifically those who are unemployed, those who are poor, uh, those who are precarious. And of course, that also concerns women and also concerns children. And so the BJC in that regard reiterates our call for gender responsive budgeting and an end to austerity measures by the states. In that regard, we politely disagree with the finance minister. We think what we presented with is um, an austerity budget. In other words, a budget that attempts to um, withdraw social spending, withdraw spending on basic services um, in order to reduce our debt. And so a key priority for us is gender responsive uh, budgeting to say that budgeting must reflect the experiences of citizens in terms of their access to basic services um, and in terms of their access to particular grants and their access to social protection. And so we recognize that one's experience of gender, for example, or one's experience of race is going to affect that. And so the state must do with everything within its power, within the confines of the constitution to ensure that people's lived experiences are reflected in the budgeting. Last year, we made a submissions to the committee um, regarding the division of uh, revenue bill. And so we did not see that it was adequate in terms of funding a gender response, uh, responsive uh, budget. And we welcome progress in that uh, regard. And so the BJC recommends public participation workshops or a process for gender responsive budgeting um, guidelines um, to follow through. So essentially our perspective is that fiscal policy has the power to advance uh, equality and socioeconomic rights. And so social spending has to ensure that those, um, uh, those aspects of our constitution are indeed uh, prioritized. And in terms of then other marginalized groups that are effect, affected by budgeting, there are children. And so this moves me on to the point of early of education, uh, education conditional grants. So we welcome the improvements, the 51% uh, and 24% increase for the early childhood development conditional grants within 2024 to 2026. Um, and so we think that this is a step in the right uh, direction, considering the amount of children identified that are en enrolled in early learning programs. And so, however, the BJC is concerned that there is no increase in the value per capita of the subsidy um, in terms of uh, the subsidy for centers and non-center based programs. And this then moves me on to the next slide concerning edu educational conditional grants. And so the we have to take the education conditional grants within the context of inflation. So the value of this subsidy has not increased since 2019. And because the subsidy has to cover costs such as staff, rent, and equipment, as well as nutrition's, uh, nutritious food to, to children, 
if it is not increased in value in the context of inflation. Um, this then translates into reduced nutritional support for children under five years, the group that is in most need of adequate nutrition to prevent malnutrition and stunting in terms of a child's growth. And that's a consistent call that we're making in this submission, that budgeting has to take into account the reality of price increases, the reality of inflation, um, and of course, the reality of unemployment inequality and just precarity in terms of the lives of working South Africans. So then moving further down below, we are pleased to see that the 300 million and 400 million um, has been put aside for 2024, 2025, and 2026 within the subsidy components for a nutrition support pilot for early learning, early learning programs um, and a results-based service delivery model. Um, so this is welcomed in the context where there are a great number of children facing barriers. Um, and so we welcome the Department of Education beginning to then testing their approaches, approaches to ensure that good nutrition is delivered to these children and that they have greater improved outcome within their early childhood uh, development. So then in terms of one of the calls that we make, we call on the Department of Education to ensure that these initiatives include a focus on unregistered ELPs, recognizing that the majority of poor children are accessing programs which are not able to register and benefit from subsidies without the support of the government. And of course, we note that this is a pilot and that it will therefore not reach the majority of children in subsidized ECD programs over um, the next MTF. So uh, increasing the child per subsidy to take into account inflation remains a big concern of the budget justice uh, coalition. So then moving on further, returning to the question of gender responsive budgeting, um, we identify the early childhood development grants as one that has significant potential for addressing gender equality with inequality, sorry, within the country. So not only are women disproportionately affected by um, unemployment, there is also the considerable amount of women support that women need within their homes in terms of the unpaid care that they do. And then of course, there is a the support that women need within the care economy itself. And as we've identified 95% of people employed within what can be identified as um, the, the sort of the care economy consists of uh, women. So we think increasing the, the per child subsidy would enable programs to employ more women and improve the wages and precarious conditions of employment uh, that women face within uh, that sector. So again, we're returning to the point of budgeting within a wider context of work precarity. Um, moving on forward then. Um, so of course, these uh, improvements to the education uh, infrastructure grants. So just highlighting again that it is laid out in the constitution that you know citizens have a right to education. And so certain infrastructure is required to be able to make that right something tangible uh, for children and South Africans in general. And so we believe it's imperative for the education system to be well resourced, um, especially within the context of our history and especially within the context where extreme weather events and the reality of climate change means that infrastructure for poor communities and rural communities as a recording in progress is facing uh, adverse challenges. So we think the state needs to spend more strategically in order to improve education infrastructure in that regards. Um, moving on forward then. Um, so, you know, we support uh, and we welcome the uh, increase to the education infrastructure grants by uh, 11% for the 2023 and 2024 years. And nearing the conclusion as it relates to education grants on the next slide. So um, one of our concerns then is the pace at which this funding is allocated specifically to unsafe school 
um, infrastructure and the pace at which we're dealing with unsafe school infrastructure, particularly within townships and rural communities. And as some may know, another young person's life was cut short um, on the 9th of March this year. Uh, a four-year-old child's lifeless body was discovered in a pit latrine uh, in a public school in the Eastern Cape. And this is one of the realities that budgeting is speaking to, to ensure that we avoid these unnecessary kinds of deaths and these unnecessary kinds of social suffering by crafting a budget that deals um, with the shortcomings of our public uh, infrastructure. Um, so within the context of the Eastern Cape, for example, and the, the why this issue is being highlighted and why it requires urgent intervention, one example is that on the 28th of February, it was reported that uh, Eastern Cape province had forfeited 100 million of the education infrastructure grants meant for public school uh, infrastructure. Um, and so th this is an issue of de debilitate, de debilitated schools, dangerous uh, schooling conditions, under-resourced schools. And so we, we identify this as one of the areas that truly requires uh, urgent and intense um, intervention. So moving down again. So um, the National School Nutrition Program has seen a proposed increase of 9.1% for this year. Um, although this is well above the headline CPI, we as B BJC recommend that the National School Nutrition Program considers the rising costs of feeding children nutritious meals as food price inflation remains higher than headline inflation. So while the 2023 budget recognizes food inflation, the food inflation rate for this year at 7%, Statistics South Africa has recorded a 13.8 year on year increase in the, in the most recent month on record. So we caution that if food prices rise at a similar rate over the next three years, the NSNP will not be adequately funded to carry the cost of meals to 9 million uh, learners. So essentially what I think is very important to take away from the first part of this submission is that um, we're living in a context where people have higher precarity as it relates to their work and their wages, um, in a context where there is decreased state capacity in terms of providing services. Recording and stopped. Protection. And compounding this is a cost of living crisis. Um, and of course, the reality of uh, inf inflation behind that. And so budgeting has to take these things into consideration while also looking at how people's identities or their positions, whether they be children or black women uh, or working class individuals are also going to influence um, how the government should budget and what it decides to prioritize. I'll give it to my uh, colleague Elroy to continue on the social relief distress grant. Please uh, uh, run over it. Uh, you, you are getting to uh, over time. Thank you, Chair. My name is Elroy Paul, a colleague of Angela Zulu. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity, our honorable members, to, to make this submission. I think I need to substantiate some of the um, statements, claims made by my colleague, Andile. Um, we at the Bud Budget Justice Coalition, consisting of uh, about 23 civil society organizations across South Africa, serving in various sectors, largely around issues of economic and um, Section 27 rights. I want to draw the attention to the slide, um, the graph. Sorry, Recording I'm, in I'm progress. Thinking and uh, talking to you, so I can't do both. There's a, a slide that says the CSG does not do enough to feed a child. So you see that when the grant was first implemented, the CSG was meant to cover the cost of food and clothing for a child. It doesn't do either of that anymore. The gap between the child support grant and the food poverty line continues to widen. The red line being the CSG and the food poverty line being the gray one. This approach, uh, despite Treasury using headline CPI to calculate the inflation increases for the CSG and other permanent grants, or perhaps because of that, the approach fails to acknowledge inequality of inflation, 
current inflation is higher for the poor, as Andile said, um, who spends a substantial portion of their household budget on food, public transport, and energy. And many of us living in South Africa know that we're one of the most unequal countries in the world with a very, very high Gini coefficient. And because of that, it's important to compare the experience and lived um, uh, uh, impact of the cost of uh, rising food prices and um, inflation in different cohorts, living standard measures. So the next graph prepared by Dr. Catherine Hall of the Children's Institute at the University of Cape Town, also a Budget Justice Coalition member, you see the, the, the blocks on the left talks about inflation for the poor compared to inflation for the rich. And you'd see that in quintile one and two, uh, on average is about 8.8, 8.5%, whereas inflation experienced the real inflation for the rich, the richest 10%, quintiles um, 10 and quintile nine is only 5%. So on average between those two blocks, the experienced inflation is between three and 5%. And average, as you can see in the block above four and a half percent. But that doesn't talk to the real harsh impact of the poorest in our community. It is very, very different lived experiences. You'd see the same in public transport and energy, whereas transport for people without a vehicle, 13%, uh, the purchase of vehicles for private transport is, is 5%. Similarly, food, which is particularly stark, basic food, inflation, 11.6%, services and luxury is 1.7%. Um, and importantly, domestic worker wages 4.2% uh, below CPI headline inflation. So, Honorable Chair and members, if I could uh, draw your attention to the next slide, which is a graph showing the 2022-23 inflation underestimate, you would see that grant increases are calculated according to projected inflation, emphasis on projected, for the coming year. You'd see in 2022, that the projected headline inflation for 2022-23 was 4.5%. This informed the thinking forward, the grant increases are 4.5%. Uh, in fact, the CSG was increased by exactly 4.5%, whereas the actual CPI, the revised estimate for 2022-23, is 7.1%, a stark difference. Grants should have received an upward adjustment before of the new inflation link increases for calculators. For example, this requires an additional 15 rand per month to the CSG before the um, current uh, financial year increase was applied. So we have, in summary, a set of recommendations. These are on gender responsive budgeting, on SRD, on CSG, and ECD related recommendations. Uh, Chair, for the sake of time, we also know that uh, the Rural Health Advocacy Project, uh, uh, Russell Rainsburg did a presentation on the implications on health, so we're not going to repeat that. Um, our, our presentation is limited to um, CSG, ECD, and Social Relief Office 3. Just a note on the gender responsive related recommendations. Um, we suggest that there is a detailed public participation workshop or even workshop or processes for the gender responsive budgeting guidelines during and post uh, this financial year. In terms of the uh, social relief of the stress recommendations, we suggest we in you increase the mean stress threshold to 663 rand, which is the 2022 food poverty line value to retain the real value of the income threshold. Otherwise, people um, have to be poorer to access the grant. And we continually, therefore, call for a universal basic income cost. The increase in the social relief of the stress to the poverty, food poverty line, or as a minimum, uh, we ask that you apply an inflation link increase to correct the erosion of the grant value since 2020. Then, Chair, uh, two, more recommend, two more recommendations. Uh, the CSG related recommendations, given the fact that if you count all the number of beneficiaries in the country, when I last checked, it was about 17 million people receiving uh, grants, of which the majority were CSG, um, and it was the smallest amount. And for that reason, amongst others, it is in need of special protection because it's by far the smallest permanent grant and no longer covers the cost of basic food as originally intended. And if this is not done, 
the failure to invest in children will result, will result in rising hunger, malnutrition, stunted growth, uh, with long-term consequences for children, society, and the economy. An additional increase to the CSG in October is what we recommend to correct for the below inflation increases of last year and to adjust for food inflation as food is the primary purpose of the grant. The ECD uh, related recommendation is that the National School Nutrition Program consists, considers rising costs of feeding children nutritious meals. For now, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Errol Paulus. Just a second. <clears throat> um, then, can we have? Um, thank you for your, for your presentation. Uh, can we have a uh, section twenty-seven? Please introduce yourself, and let's see who we are talking to. Thank you. Hi. I hope you guys can all hear me. Um, greetings, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members and colleagues. Uh, my name is Matsiriso Lengwasa and I'm a budget researcher at Section 27. I will turn off my, uh, my video um, and share my screen. And sorry, can I please get sharing rights? Um, They're in. Matsiriso is asking, good morning, Matsiriso. Person on it. Person, for some reason, it doesn't want to allow me to make uh, CD. So, okay, okay, see. It's from my side. Now she's a co-host now. Okay, let's see this so. Are you okay? Yes, so I will share my screen um, now. Thank you. I believe you guys can, will see it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just start the presentation. Um, so yeah, I'm done my greetings. Um, so for this presentation, I will be doing this presentation with my um, colleagues, our senior research at, um, researcher, uh, Daniel McLaren, who's also on the call. I'll be covering the introduction, gender responsive budgeting, and then we'll switch over to him to outline the personnel funding challenges and basic education funding. And then I'll wrap up again with healthcare and the conclusions and recommendations. So. We are pleased to make this submission at a time that is very um, challenging for the country. So we all know that South Africa is experiencing two concurrent states of national disaster. Um, we have new stories every day of corruption, um, and we our economic growth has gr gone ground to a halt. So as Section 27, we are a public interest law center, and we're interested in the power that the Division of Revenue Bill has to protect the right to basic education and right to health access to healthcare services in these deeply challenging circumstances, but also in the long term. Our presentation will be largely infused by the perspectives um, from our field research of what they have identified um, regarding the realization or the restrictions towards the right to basic education and access to healthcare services in the provinces. So overall, we submit that healthcare funding allocations have ignored the rising number of uninsured people in the country, the increase in cost of services provided by the sector, as well as the state of emerge, well, the state of disaster regarding um, load shedding. We wonder how facilities are, healthcare facilities are expected to keep running when there's no funding that's allocated to the provinces to do so. For our basic education funding, so some conditional grants do increase above inflation, which we welcome. However, some don't, and this may mean that programs do not have the financial resources to protect the right to basic education for the most vulnerable learners in the country. We also add that um, 
it's not just the quantum of spend, so how much is allocated um, to the provinces that is an issue. One of the issues that we've highlighted is that social spending departments have underspent by 17 billion last year, and that was reported by um, the head of the the head of the budget office at the um, committee at the presentation on the fine um, to the finance committees. We also submit that the provincial equitable share has only increased by 1.2% this year, which is well below the CPI and ignores the increasing public service usage in the country. Um, however, conditional grants have fared better with a 6.7% increase, which is well above um, CPI inflation that we welcome. So we've made a few recommendations that I'll speak to towards the end of our um, slide, but it's really our presentation is rooted around um, human rights impact assessments, intervention on underspending and public gender responsive budgeting workshops, which the Budget Justice Coalition has alluded to. So speaking of gender responsive budgeting, last year we had made submissions to this committee critiquing the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill for not allocating funding in a manner that reflects the lived experiences of different um, people in the country, people who identify differently, particularly marginalized communities. So we are pleased that the Appropriations Committee has pursued this recommendation um, and we have seen it in linked in the budget review for the 2023-24 year. Um, so we welcome the completion of the development of gender responsive budgeting guidelines and the intention to workshop these in the coming financial year. We do recommend that this workshopping of these um, gender responsive guidelines are facilitated in a public way so that the, the gender responsive budget can be shaped by the lived experiences from people on the ground and from experts who work on gender issues on a day to day. Um, just a recap on the necessity of gender responsive budgeting. Uh, we spoke to this last year, but women manage 42.1% home, of homes in South Africa, and these households are 40% poorer than the ones headed by men. This gender gap in poverty exists in every um, line or in, in every line of poverty. Um, and this is referred to as the feminization of poverty um, phenomena. And we feel that the, the a gender responsive budget is one way to tackle um, this phenomena, uh, especially in a country where women disproportionately bear the burden of um, cuts to social spending owing to gendered norms, racial norms um, in the country. And we have identified ECD, the school nutrition program, HIV and AIDS funding and funding for learners with profound intellectual disabilities grants as areas that could advance gender equity in the country. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague Daniel to um, explore personnel challenges. Thank you, Sidi. Good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members. I'm going to speak mainly to the personnel funding challenges which we are, are seeing in the budget, uh, Section 27 and less so on the basic education conditional grants um, because a number of the presentations have covered those quite extensively. So I don't want to repeat and rather we'll focus on the personnel uh, issues. So I think honorable members will be aware that healthcare and, edu and education, which are the two areas where section 27 focuses are very personnel uh, heavy sectors. About 60% of the health budget is spent on personnel and about 80% of the basic education budget is spent on, on personnel, mainly teachers. And that's completely normal. Um, what that means, however, is that when there is this pressure on the wage bill coming um, from government, from National Treasury, from the Minister of Finance, as there has been in, in recent years, that is very likely to translate directly into pressure on these sectors. Um, and what we are concerned with in the main in, in the 2023 Division of Revenue Bill is that the uh, shortfalls in personnel budgeting, um, which we've seen in recent years, are likely to continue. The 2023 Division of Revenue Bill and the budget overall allocates a 1.5% nominal increase to the wage bill in 2023-24 and, and an average of 3.3% increase over the medium term. And these are very low increases given the inflation that we're seeing in the economy, as well as the growing population. And um, our point is essentially that in the absence of an agreement with the public sector unions, which with all of the strikes going on at the moment, we can see is very far from being reached. Um, and that in the absence of an agreement which balances the needs of service users 
which have been spoken about today, as well as worker paying conditions and the government's fiscal policy, these very small increases to the, the wage bill will likely result in, in further decreases in pay and working conditions and more shortfalls in personnel for the basic education and healthcare sectors. Next slide, please. Um, likewise, when, you, when we see that the provincial equitable share is not being increased in line with inflation, since, since that is the bulk funding which pays the salaries of teachers and, and healthcare workers, that also translates directly into pressure um, on, on these sectors. So what we see over the 2023 MTF is only a 1.5% increase on, in, on the average to the provincial equitable share. And this is very, very concerning for us. The research by the Public Economy Project has found that since 2012, there's, there has been a significant decline in the number of education personnel as well as the number of healthcare workers owing in the main to uh, personnel funding pressures. Next slide, please. So just looking at in depth at the basic education sector, Minister Mocheka has estimated in 2021 that there were 24,000 unfilled teacher posts. And National Treasury also recognized that its pressure on the public sector wage bill has uh, increased class sizes um, because the number of teachers hasn't been increasing at the rate of the number of learners. And this is impacting uh, learning outcomes. This was a very stark admission for us to see the government admitting that its fiscal consolidation policy was directly targeting the basic education sector and resulting in worsening outcomes. And as a result, the funding shortfalls in the Division of Revenue Bill are directly undermining the right to basic education. Um, we've spoken to a number of our field workers who work on the ground in provinces such as Limpopo and Eastern Cape um, about what the impact of these funding uh, shortfalls are on the ground. And some of the things that they've told us are, for example, that many of the no-fee schools, and these are the schools that are totally reliant on government funding, um, they are, many of them are reliant, um, particularly in Limpopo, um, on volunteers because there's just a lack of, of permanent qualified staff at these schools. And so people are getting volunteers from the community to come in and support um, teaching and learning because of the, of the, of the shortfalls in, in uh, qualified staff. Next slide, please. If we look at um, health sector, we, we had an estimate of about 37,000 vacancies in the sector overall in 2018. In public hospitals, this translates to about 10,000 nurses and 1,300 doctors. And this goes against the government's policy um, through the, the National Health Department to actually increase primary healthcare workers by about 88,000 by 2025 in order to meet uh, the primary healthcare needs of the country. Um, what our field workers have told us is um, how this translates on the ground is that many clinics which are supposed to have two or three staff um, or two or three nurses, one doctor, some administrative staff often just have a skeleton staff and not open when they're supposed to be. As a result, people end up going to hospitals where they expect to, to, to be treated because the services are not available in the local clinics, but this is very costly and it just puts pressure on hospitals where the cost of care is actually much more expensive. Next slide, please. So both headcounts and the pay of, of workers in these sectors is being affected. And this is research from the Public Economy Project showing that um, the pay of nurses, doctors, and educators has gone down since 2019. It reached its height in 2019. And the forecast in the current budget proposals is that the pay um, of nurses, doctors, and teachers will continue to go down over the medium term. Next slide, please. It's important for the committee to note that um, the impact of this isn't neutral when it comes to inequality. What we're seeing, um, again, through research uh, undertaken by the Public Economy Project is, as the state retreats from its constitutional obligations to provide quality education and healthcare, so people um, look elsewhere. If they can't find a good school and they have a little bit of money in their pockets, they will seek to, 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 to find a private school where they can get what they perceive as a, a potentially better education, and the same for healthcare services. And so while the shortfalls in the public sector, we're seeing more and more people employed in the private sector, and this is bad for inequality because, of course, it's only those with money who are able to opt out of the public system. Those who can't are left with um, increasing class sizes and uh, declining standards of education and healthcare. So our recommendations in, in relation to personnel is that we have to see some political leadership and some bold decisions from government and the public sector unions to find common ground 
because we haven't seen that in recent years. We've just seen a, a government committed to fiscal um, consolidation, and we've seen um, the bargaining council negotiations constantly falling short, strikes uh, continuing, matters going to court. This can't go on because as this goes on, uh, we're seeing headcounts being reduced and um, paying conditions worsening. So next slide, please. Um, we also, um, um, while we call on unions and government to find a solution, we're also calling on government to increase the provincial equitable share. Um, three more years of cuts to the provincial equitable share will negatively impact the right to basic education and the right to health care, particularly in terms of, of personnel. Um, and we'd like to see some response from the government in relation to the impact of funding shortfalls on personnel in terms of uh, impacts on inequality. Finally, um, we want to see um, efforts to reform the structure of the wage bill within these sectors. And there's lots of opportunities in healthcare, as the Rural Health Advocacy Project talked about, about getting the staffing right at the primary healthcare level so that we don't need to treat people always in hospitals. And we need to see the implementation of a long term human resources uh, plan, both in the health sector and in the education sector. So just in terms of basic education funding overall, we're very concerned again at the fact that the increase to funding overall for basic education is far below inflation and increasing learning enrollment. So the wage bill itself is under pressure, but overall the budget is also under pressure. And this is translating if the budget is implemented and not adjusted in the medium term budget um, to quite significant per learner decreases over the next three years. I'm not going to say that much about some of the grants because they have been covered extensively. What I would just say on the next slide, CD, is that the Education Infrastructure Grant, um, it's been noted that it isn't being implemented well in some provinces. And we have to see coordination by government and oversight, better oversight from parliamentary stakeholders at national and provincial level of the spending on this grant so that the money that's being allocated can actually result in safe and hygienic schools. Um, we'll skip over the SIBG because a lot has been said about that. And the school nutrition program, again, reiterating that Parliament will need to be watching this grant if food price inflation continues to increase. We will need to see further increases to this grant at the midpoint of the year. The last thing I want to dwell on is just learner teacher support material. We have seen a, a quite a big reduction in funding for learner teacher support material from 6.4 billion to 5.8 billion rand this year. And this is something that we've um, done a lot of organizing on and ran cases on and the significant judgments compelling the Department of Basic Education to ensure that all learners have access to LTSM at the start of a school year. And we're therefore very concerned about the cuts to this, bu this budget and this funding. And we'd like to know what steps are being taken to ensure that these funding cuts do not result in a det deterioration in the quality of workbooks and, and LTSM that's available in public schools. I'll finish there because ECD has also been significant, significantly covered. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So I'll continue with the health conditional grant. So overall, there's been but a real term. Th but this, Hi. Please run, over that. please run over that. You are already on injury time, big time. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'll just yeah. skip to um, the health facility revitalization grant. Um, so the committee has relayed our recommendation to increase the funding in response to the destruction of health facilities last year in the floods. Um, however, this you know has fallen short at Treasury and Treasury has directed it to the Minister of Health. Um, instead, the increase has only been 2.7% for this grant, which is below CPI. And we're unsure how um, health facilities are meant to be constructed efficiently, but also are meant to stay open during load shedding, during the state of um, emergency of load shedding, when there's no financial allocation um, to support that. Uh, for the oncology grants, we most um, overall um, pleased at some of the plans that National Treasury has um, announced. So rolling out oncology services to Mpumalanga and Limpopo to reduce referrals to Gauteng does make um, healthcare services more accessible in the country. And through our work with the Cancer Alliance to propose solutions to address these backlogs, we're pleased that the Gauteng Treasury has announced that it has set aside 784 million to deal with these backlogs. Um, regarding mental health, we are we recommend CPI-linked increases in order to ensure that a country where 
75% of people who are living with mental health illnesses are unable to access treatment. We can expand treatment for that. Um, regarding HIV and TB, we'd like to request clarity on how the provinces should provide services to achieve targets. So there's been an increased targets to 6 million patients on air antiretroviral treatment. However, there's been allocated a 0.4 nominal cut. And so we're unsure how provinces are expected to reach these goals without the financial resources to support that. Um, in conclusion, we recognize that this bill is an opportunity for the state to rectify and redress cuts to healthcare and education that may threaten the province's ability to provide and protect these rights. Uh, we've received comfort seeing the Appropriations Committee relay extend civil society recommendations to Treasury and believe that this is a good step in advancing the realization of these rights. However, we do recommend um, calling on human rights impact assessments um, to inform and precede these cuts, even if these cuts are in real terms, so that we, um, you know, and how this looks like is that if there are cuts that are made, that there should be a justification or an explanation and proof that the education and healthcare rights will be protected, even in spite of the cuts. We also call on, like we mentioned earlier, public um, gender-responsive budgeting workshops, and we welcome Treasury's in investments and increased build, um, capacity building and call on continued um, capacity building in order to resolve underspending in the provinces. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate that the UN has also recommended that South Africa increase the level of funding in social security and education. Um, thank you so much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank, thank you so much, Matsi uh, Tiso uh, uh, and, uh, and Daniel, for the presentation um, <clears throat> from BJC. Um, honorable members, we have got uh, all these presentations, and it's now your opportunity uh, to. Uh, <clears throat> to engage with the, presenter, with the presenters um, <clears throat> to find some clarities or, or make some uh, short inputs. Uh, oral members, you know how we do it. Can I have indications of uh, oral members who would like to have a say? Sheikh Imam Chair. Honorable Sheikh Imam, good morning, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Matafa. Honorable Matafa. Honorable members. Honorable members, any other honorable member? I know we're, we're, we're having a problem of connectivity, so members keep, keep on coming in and out. Kaiso. Honorable Kaiso. Thank you, Honorable Tlangwini, uh, Chair. Honorable Tlangwini. Any other or uh, any other or member after or Okay, let's let's um, um, let's be economic with our time, but I'm not going to uh, to 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 limit you. Uh, let's see. Let's let's start with uh, uh, as you pose the question. Uh, if you can uh, please say uh, who are you directing that question to? Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Please come in. Thank you very much, Chair. I wish that we could change the system of these raising questions and getting responses, because sometimes we got concerns that are raised by the different organizations, but we are not able to do justice in terms of interrogating the issue. But be that as it may, since we have the system in place, let's do justice. To it. Now, I want to first of all, thank all those that made constructive criticism and suggestions. Indeed, one thing I think we must agree with, that a lot of what you spoke about, particularly in the health sector, in the justice sector and things, you need more money, more resources available to them, delivery of local government services, whatever. But what I'm not finding, Chair, first of all, let me start off with, I think, money.com. And, and I know that this is, 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 you made a statement that we members of parliament earn one million rand and things, we must cut that. I'd like to ask you if you know and understand what happens to the 1 million rand that the members of parliament get paid. But since you did not do enough research, let me tell you. 
Half of that money, first of all, goes towards taxes, which we pay for, which goes towards social grants and many other things. Secondly, you need to consider that these members of parliament spend half their lives without their families, don't even see them growing. Thirdly, that if they live from another province and whatever it is, they have commitments here like they have there, so they have to run two households. Fourthly, when they have vehicles that they have one there, they have to have here, they have to put petrol, nobody gives you money for all that. Fifth, let me tell you very importantly, often we don't even have time to have a proper meal because we are expected to take calls and concerns raised all the time. I'd like to find out if you've ever considered that, the one million you're talking about. The second thing that I want to ask is this, do organizations understand that if you have a hundred rand as far as your budget, and you have to allocate them based on the maximum that is available, hundred rand. How do you then do justice to it, okay? Uh, and, and, and appropriately accordingly so that that particular sector does not suffer. Now I'm saying it's almost impossible to do that. But what I am not finding, Chairperson, and I'd love this to happen in the future. When you come to this uh, uh, particular hearings that's taking place, for me, it's a bit too late. I would love to know if all your organizations will work together with the members of parliament that you talk about, political public representatives, and find out how can we have more money available. And that is why I want to ask this question. Do any of you know how much of money we lose in South Africa as a result of which my chairperson knows because I sound like a stock record because we don't get value for money. Well, let me tell you, we're losing over 300 billion rand. So does that not tell you that we might not have a problem to appropriate further resources if we deal with that? How do we deal with that? That is where the organization on the ground who are the heartbeat of the people should come in so that we can go out there and ensure we get value for money and save that money. Now I've heard Kosatu and others talk about dysfunctional money. You are correct. But we raise this time and time again. Every single political party raises it all the time. Do you understand how the multi-party democracy system works and how much members of parliament can do and what they can't do? Please, I'd like you to research that. I would love to know what our organizations doing to help us to get on the ground and deal with why farm municipalities that didn't function. You don't know, let me tell you. Lack of capacity, corruption and looting, okay? Tender, tender, printer, tender frauds that's taking place then, okay? Giving jobs to pals, tailor deployment then. And this is to all parties wherever they govern. There's no one particular party that's responsible. But what are we doing or can we together in the future go to the grassroots? You are correct. We are living in the most unequal society. Yes, I agree with that. And it's going to continue. What are we doing? And I'm raising this to everybody, Chairperson. This country has got a population increase of over 1 million a year. 91,000 children gave birth to children last year. Do you think we can accommodate them in your social relief distress grants or any child support grant? You think it's sustainable? That's not going to be. The high levels of crime, do you think you're putting more police officers can solve the problem? No. Let's talk about creation of jobs. Can you tell us, even from the union perspective, have you done anything? First of all, workshopping, training, empowering people, because where there's a corrupter, there's a corruptee. And so everywhere where there's a politician that's involved in corruption in all the local provincial national government, there's also corruption, which is the official. These are employees that pay union contribution. What have you done to work with them? Have any of you ever engaged with one political party other than those that you may be aligned to? to sit with us and ask us, what is going wrong? Why can't you do this? What, how can we help you? How can we work together? Because that's what we want. We want a partnership. We know the problem, like you know, but we want to sort it. So can you tell us, have you done that to any one political party other than the one you aligned to? If you've spoken to them to ask them, what is going on? How can we change this? Y'all are there. Y'all are supposed to be doing something about it. Why can't you do it? What, are, uh, 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 what is the reason that you are failing? You please, I'd, I'd like you to ask us this. Now I have raised, and Chairperson knows, on the issue of creating a transparent, credible process so you'll, you'll save billions of rands in this country. 
and you'll have the delivery of services enhanced. Would you be willing to partner with all of us, all political parties on this committee to go out this protest, raise your voices and say, no, we want to know who's getting all the standards. When did you get it? Who are you? How much it is? What is the value? What is the item? Can you do that? I want, why I'm raising these things, Chairperson? The problem in the country can only be solved if we have a holistic approach, if all role players can come together. Have you ever asked the police officers, go to, go to commercial crime unit in the Western Cape, go and look at the conditions they work on. Go and speak to a detective. Have you done that to find out how many dockets you've got? Can you do justice to 200 dockets? Go and ask them. Then you'll have a better understanding of how serious the problem is. And we can only win this battle collectively. And I'm saying there is enough resources, but it's going in the wrong hand, which you are raising. I'm just concerned about the way you raise it. Some of you, not all of you, okay? So all I'm asking is, can you then create some pact with us? Because we are not you and us, we are together. In this. We need to save this country. We need to work together. We need to close the gaps. Can you work together? Can you arrange an environment where we can engage with each other? Lastly, I would say on the issue of job creation, I've never heard any of these organizations, person, and I'd like them to tell me if they did. Have you ever raised the concern as to why we can't create jobs in this country? Yes, you all say we must create jobs. Yes, I agree. Can you create jobs if every other item is imported into the country? Can you, can you create jobs if the cost of doing business is so high and so stringent only for South African workers and South African owners of businesses? while the masses of the foreign businesses are getting away with murder in this country? Have you ever done anything about going from business to business to ensure, and you talk about taking from the rich and giving the poor 13 or 15% pay tax only country in the world? And those are the people leaving the country. Why are you not assisting us all, going and engaging with your communities, identifying all these businesses, illicit financial flows is massive in this country. Most of these foreign businesses don't pay taxes, nothing uncomplied. You see how much more revenue you'll get? You see how we can solve your problem and how we can give more and more to the community? Solutions are there, but we need to engage and we need to come together. I'm going to uh, stop there for now, Chair. There's so much more here, but I think it will be unfair to, 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 to uh, 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 my, my colleagues there. Uh, but I'll come back if necessary later. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Honorable Matafa. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, good morning, Chair, uh, members of the committee and all guests. Now, Chair, I think uh, Honorable Sheikh would have touched on the points that I had, but I will just pose one question and make a comment. The one question he would have spoken to that, or maybe before I pose a question, let me thank all the presenters for the presentations that they've made to the committee. We really appreciate your commitment and your willingness to assist the work of parliament in terms of uh, managing its uh, uh, public uh, resources. Chair, the, the question is in relation with the issue of uh, municipalities under distress. And I would like to pose this question to uh, Kosatu. And, and ju just to find out from Matthew Parks, if whether the view that we already have agreed upon that probably the municipalities are struggling because of lack of capacity and the inability for project planning and implementation hold, holds water. And if it does, there's an indictment that this is normally caused by the fact that either people without proper qualifications and experience are employed or they are misplaced within the system. So what we know, Chair, is that uh, COSAT would have affiliates in these various levels of government. And in most cases, when we deal with issues of staffing, they sit in those particular interviews. So the question is the second one. The first one is if whether the view holds water. The second one is to find out if whether COSAT has done any study or maybe through its representatives, try to understand why is this problem persisting of employing the wrong people and misplacing them in the system? And what does COSA to recommend 
uh, to the committee maybe to be able to take the matter up either with COCTA or other stakeholders in the local sphere of government in order to eradicate this problem once and for all. The second point, Chair, is just a comment, and this issue is coming uh, in various presentations on the amount of the um, uh, 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 350 grant, that maybe it is not sufficient, but I think it's also important that we use this platform to remind our stakeholders that government and the president has made pronouncement that we are working on mechanisms to develop a system for targeted basic income. And the income grant as one of, of measures to uplift those that are, are most vulnerable uh, whilst within fiscal constraints is a matter that is being considered and it is on the table. So on that one, Chair, I will say that it, it's correct that this issue is being raised by our stakeholders. And it's a matter that we are aligned with as far as the state is concerned. And we are willing to uh, uh, walk the journey with. But one thing that we must never forget is that currently uh, we are faced with fiscal constraints. And when we move, we must move responsibly to ensure that uh, the finances of the country are managed prudently and we don't lend our future generations in uh, more troubles than where we are now. But other than that, Chair, I'm happy with the presentations and will definitely take some of their points as areas of consideration when we finalize this particular bill. And we thank them once again. Thank you very much, Chair Pese. Thank you, Honorable Matafa. Uh, Honorable uh, <clears throat> Aiso, please come in. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And uh, thanks for the presenters. And uh, everyone on the platform and greetings to you all. Honorable Chair, I don't think I have many questions here. Uh, um, I just want to well appreciate the positive contributions which all uh, participatory uh, organizations have done uh, this morning. Well, from Kosatu, as usually, uh, has made a very, you know, uh, uh, helpful uh, contribution to us this uh, two uh, uh, discussion on division of re revenue amendment bill and the second adjustment appropriation bill. So I just want to. Uh, check from COSA to this point, because there has been always a, an outcry with regard to budget cuts. But I haven't heard much uh, weight on, on, on this issue as to whether COSA has considered to, to how it should be handled or why is it the voice of COSA not uh, coming up very clear on this issue called Underspending because it is a threat to service delivery. So I would have loved a situation where I, we also hear from the workers themselves saying, "No, no, a budget can't be, you know, uh, 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 be given out, and then there's what follows is underspending." So what I'm trying to say, uh, um, Comrade Mark, is that. I haven't heard a word around that because many uh, people who, who talks about uh, budget, they would leave out the issue which is called underspending, which is directly related to, 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 to budgeting itself. So I just want to know uh, why is not that uh, COSATU doesn't become critical to this area because I think it's very critical that uh, that matter, it, 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 it has to be, you know, uh, uh, corrected. And we must hear a lot of support on the ground that says, yeah, we do see this uh, underspending here, uh, not only budget cuts, because it's, it, it poses a very serious threat to the very uh, existing uh, uh, fiscal. Now, secondly, I just want to understand from COSATU, are you suggesting on the SRD grants that uh, instead of just uh, issuing the 
the, the SRD grants, it's, is it important that we rather look forward for reskilling of the, all the recipients of the grants such that they should be, you know, uh, find it very easy in future to get some, uh, you know, a job to, to can be able to uh, make a living or is just a, a, yeah, I just want to understand that. Is it what you are proposing around it? But over and above that, uh, I, I think uh, what my colleague has already elaborated on, upon, on what the president has already said that they have to have, there must be a way to build out, uh, build up on, on, on this issue such that now we have a, a way that would you know, uh, address inclusively this issue of a social grant and uh, uh, SRD grant in a form of, you know, uh, making a, a conclusion, a determination around the issue of basic income grant. It will be a, a, a lifelong solution uh, in future. So that definitely has to be frustrated in future, uh, such that now, if it beyond 2024, uh, this grant, uh, in case there, there isn't no a, a finally concluded, you know, uh, 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 matter on the, on the basic income grant at that time, at that stage, it has to be sustained. I think it should be, it would be uh, a, a very good thing, uh, given the situation that the fact that the uh, economy has been performing very poor. I mean, I mean, 2008, there has never been any uh, quite a significant improvement in as far as uh, world economies are concerned, in, in particular here, uh, in, in our country as well, since 2008. So, I mean, there's been a, a very steep in, in terms of uh, high price increase in commodities that has made the lives of ordinary people become, you know, very difficult to, to survive. And, and you would, uh, one, uh, listen to what Dr. Uh, uh, Moby uh, uh, has said, in as far as the issue that affects Abu Koko. So, so also that has to be you know, considered uh, in, in future because uh, like I have said that since 2008, uh, so economics has been performing very poor and inflation has been climbing uh, you know, uh, uh, and climbing without any you know, uh, uh, sign that, those that are at the lowest level will find it very easy to survive uh, the, 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 the conditions that they find themselves in. So on this one that has been, uh, the, the issue that has been raised by uh, the justice organization around the issue of toilet latrines. Uh, I think this honorable chair is, is an indictment upon us. Uh, I mean, to hear, that even up to today, there are still children who fall uh, in pit latrine toilets. It's really an indictment upon us because uh, uh, budget has been uh, given out for departments to spend. And you see some departments are not spending this budget. Instead, they return this budget. But you still find children uh, who are supposed to have been built uh, 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 flushable toilets, they still have pit latrines and they fall into those pit, pit latrines. So I'm saying it's a serious indictment upon us that uh, if the department does not wake up from this uh, 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 situation or scenario, uh, we, 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 it, it, it's a serious uh, indictment upon us uh, on our chair. So let me uh, pause at this stage, Chair, and uh, I'll come back if there's any other point that I need to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Kaiso. Honorable Tlangwini, please come in. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for all of the presentations um, from all of the stakeholders. Um, you know, no, Chair, you know, Many a times we get very concrete proposals from various stakeholders. And it just seems to, to me that 
they come and present and they give us some form of recommendations or some form of um, inputs and it's just stagnant to us. There's no, um, I feel we don't, or departments don't take it seriously because we do a report, we give our report forward and then what happens to our recommendations as a committee. So um, I really think that at some point we need to, as a committee, um, really uh, uh, do our work in such a way that departments don't take advantage of this process when it comes to the budget process, because likely I think uh, um, it's a waste of, of, of our time because our, our recommendations are not taken seriously. Um, 100 billion rand was sent back from Eastern Cape of infrastructure, of the infrastructure grant was sent back to National Treasury because the Eastern Cape failed to spend that money. And then you were here weeks after that reports of a child being a felt into a pit toilet. And that is the one that was reported. Where is the unreported cases that they may be of children that have died of such incidents and money are being sent back? At some stage, criminal cases must be open against the minister of this department for not, or the premier, for not spending so much money. And then you are having kids having to lose their lives in this uh, uh, situation within Eastern Cape. And it's Eastern Cape, and I, I've pleaded last time, Chair, to the committee, we need to pay much more emphasis to, to Eastern Cape and zoom in in that area because it's really heartbroken what is happening there in terms of the education system, in terms of sanitation and all manner of things, healthcare, everything is in a complete collapse. And year on year, you just hear reports of money going back to National Treasury that was unspent. And, 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 and that is really an indictment to our communities. The one of the ghost workers, um, uh, I would have wanted Kosato to maybe give us a, a proposal. What needs to happen with, with, with in this uh, departments to source out all of these ghost workers? Because if Prasa can have so many many ghost workers, and the state is paying it month on on month, what is happening in other departments? So uh, I would like Kosato to give us a proposal. What needs to happen in terms of sourcing out all of these ghost employees within departments, because I believe it's not only in Prasa, you would, it, it, it is widespread. Then the, the, the other point that I want to agree upon, Chair, is the 350 grant. Um, we have even heard reports numerous times that have came to us that the application there of, um, the, those that needs to access it doesn't access it um, uh, uh, um, at the time that they need it. So uh, we need to pay also closer, more closer attention to that, to social development, to, en to enforce them, to, to ensure that they go out and, 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 and ensure that our communities are getting these 350 grants. And the one on the TB and anti um, retrovirus treatment chair, I we have always been uh, we have always been as the EFF saying that budget cut on on that section of the of of Department of Health's budget. It's, it's criminal because we still have communities that 
TB is still rife in, you know, you still have a lot of TB outbreaks. You still have um, a lot of uh, um, um, communities or people that doesn't get access to antiretroviral virals. So we need to um, really make a strong recommendation for those budget cuts needs to needs to be stopped in, in that area. And then um, I think um, Dan Che, it was just that question and then maybe those few comments. Thank you very much, Che. Thank you, Honorable Ntlangwini. Honorable Sheikh Imam, anything you want to add? Honorable Matafa. Honorable Kaiso. No, Che, I'm covered. Honorable Ntlangwini, is anything pressing? Che? And the, the 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 last point that I want to make, I don't know if I've made it earlier on. We mm -hmm. as the appropriations committee must come to a point where we we reject some of these budgets or not reject it, maybe hold it where departments can and, and see how we can reallocate some of the monies to a longer process, not outright sort of maybe reject it, but maybe prolong it and uh, uh, to a, a longer period so that some of these stakeholders, when they come and present to us or um, PPO come and present to us and all of that, we um, sort of say to the to National Treasury, here is our inputs. Uh, we foresee that you guys need to go and, and, and rework this budget. Maybe perhaps um, the, um, the staff can also, or researchers can also help us in terms of uh, um, finding out um, legally, are we entitled to, to, to do that? Because uh, it's year on year that we are just accepting the department's budget. And I just feel that our recommendations are just gathering dust. I have never seen any of our recommendations taking a, a national tre treasury actually implement any of our recommendations that we have made as an appro appropriations committee. So maybe we must just look at the legality of it in maybe saying we are giving you two weeks or three weeks to rework the budget. And this is what we are, are coming up with if we can do it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Honorable uh, uh, Tlangwini. <clears throat> Let me also uh, join my uh, uh, colleagues in welcoming all the all the presentations, and uh, uh, agreeing that uh, uh, they do make very uh, <clears throat> important uh, uh, presentations. Um, just to say that uh, <clears throat> as long as we know the 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 basic uh constraint that we have is that uh, the main of these conflicting uh, uh priorities that government must deal with perhaps let me start with uh, uh, uh comrade me uh native parks mm -hmm. uh i just want to check from from the side of of COSAT. i think we, we we agree that our solution to many of our socioeconomic challenges is to grow the economy and grow it inclusively and grow for everybody else. One of the things that we have, has, has been identified in the ERRP is, is, is localization, which will lead to higher economic growth and more employment opportunities, especially using public procurement. So I just want to check that with all the problems that Prasa have real and imagined, have you ever visited the state of the art Donato train production plant in Ekoruleni. And are there any lessons that can be taken? Because there, it was public procurement that was used to make sure that we don't import things, that uh, uh, state-of-the-art trains that are being uh, 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 produced there. It was using public procurement to make sure that we don't export jobs. Have you been there in Kosat? And what lessons uh, can you take uh, from that? 
and that that will share it with your with your with your other colleagues. Again, this is for COSAT. Uh, municipalities are owed uh, about 300 billion rand uh, <clears throat> that using the end of, uh, of 2022 uh, statistics of that households are owing municipalities 71%. So the question is what is COSATI doing to persuade its members to pay uh, uh, for services or put alternate uh, uh, differently? Uh, are there any of the members of COSAT who are, who are not paying for the services that they are getting? And if so, what is it that we are doing? But even more than that, uh, workers are part of the communities. Are there any programs that are, uh, that as COSATU and other federations were involved in in trying to save our municipalities by paying what is due to them? We have engaged with the Minister of Finance, <clears throat> um, and uh, about fifty-seven billion rand is is owed to ESCOM. Uh, by the municipalities. And by the way, you'll find that in most cases, um, communities would have paid and the money is just not transferred to, to ESCOM. Um, and some of the, 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 the challenges that we're having at ESCOM is because of that. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm saying uh, you would have heard that the, uh, the, the Minister of Finance would like to intervene there and try to take uh, that debt uh, 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 to the to the uh, government debt, but now there is a concern coming from uh, from the minister, and I'm sure from all of us that immediately you do that, uh, the debt will start accumulating. What do you think should be done to try and avoid avoid that? I think all, most of the presenters here have raised the question of limited funds going to the municipalities. But uh, again, this will, will uh, 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 the question goes to COSAT. And it goes to, uh, is related to what the Honorable Kaiso was raising. But I'm, I'm being specific about uh, <clears throat> uh, conditional grants which are not being. Um, <clears throat> best accessed by the municipalities and not used and underspent on. And this is in the context of us saying that there are limited resources and then resources are being made available and then these resources are not spent. I'm, I'm saying then uh, your constituent uh, unions, what are they doing at, 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 at those municipalities to make sure that money which must be going uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the people, uh, which has been uh, budgeted for, and approved by this committee and by this parliament is a uh, people who are, are the ultimate beneficiaries do have access to this. What we can say, uh, um, it's, it's one thing which is really frustrating us because we go, you argue for this budget and say, please take so much, municipalities want more money, but we have, uh, <clears throat> we have municipalities not uh, 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 using or accessing the money. Um, at some stage, this committee had to call uh, certain municipalities around IPTNG to say, can they appear before us so that they can explain? But uh, there haven't been positive results. So what is the role of, 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 of COSAT? First, as, as, as a federation and again, as, as, as part of uh, the members of community. <clears throat> Next question. The failure of proper billing by certain municipalities has been uh, identified as a, as a problem for lack of payments by customers. What, how, what's the extent of the problem now? And uh, yeah, what's the extent of the problem and what has been done about it? Uh, coming to amanda.mobi. Uh, talking about the 30 billion rand uh, social grant increase, uh, which you say uh, it's, 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 not, it's not enough. I just want to check uh, whether you do take into consideration other interventions that uh, are made by government, especially around, around the indigents. And again, the interventions, uh, for instance, in free, uh, in free education and so on and so forth. 
because all those interventions uh, are made uh, with the, the poorest of the poor uh, in, 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 in mind. So what's your comment on that? Because we, we shouldn't create an, an impression that uh, um, <clears throat> the social grants or the SRT grant are the only um, interventions by government to help the poorest of the poor. Um, Amanda Dot Moby, and I think it has been raised by uh, other presenters, the question of, of, of the 350 rand, which doesn't factor in uh, in inflation. And we agree with you uh, there that it, it is a, a, a problem. But um, um, as you're asking, what is this committee doing? If you can look at our, at, at our reports, it's an issue that has been raised with National Treasury and with Parliament through our reports, but again in our interventions with uh, National Treasury. That, uh, so I'm trying to say something's happening. Again, when you look at the post, at the close of post office, um, uh, and we have been listened to, um, we've been saying that the post offices are very important for the grants, all types of grants, and for the rural communities. And there is a, 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 a second adjustment amendment bill uh, uh, which allocates 2.4 billion rand uh, to uh, to the to the post office. So I'm just saying that some of the of of the interventions coming from our our, our side and being taken up by a, 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 a by government. Um, rural health advocacy. And I think it also applies uh, to TB, um, <clears throat> Accountability cons uh, cons Consortium, and to a, a BJ BJC to an extent. I'm just saying that uh, there is an issue that is being made about the provincial equitable share, especially as it goes to health and other places that it is declining. So my, 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 my question is, do you factor in that there were a lot of interventions which were specific for COVID-19 uh, pandemic? And obviously it was a, a particular intervention. And after that, there's a, there's a process of, of normalizing the allocation. Do you factor in when you are making, do you factor, mean, factor in uh, that intervention when you are making the, the statement that you are making? Again, I think to, uh, uh, to all of you, because you, when you talk about the health, uh, issues and even education. Um, you know that this, uh, this service mainly is being provided by the, by the provinces. I just want to check whether you do uh, interact with the provinces when it comes to the way uh, health is, 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 being, is being provided in the provinces. Uh, and some of, uh, yeah, just want to hear your, what your comment will be when it comes to that. I, I think let me leave it at, at, at that and uh, welcome again uh, your appreciation of the interventions which have been made on the ECD, amongst other things, B, B, uh, uh, BJC. Yeah, I'll allow you to, to respond uh, in that order. Um, we'll start with Kosatu and then next, next, next. I'll, I'll remind you after Kosatu comes in. Kosatu, please come in. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. Just to check, um, how many minutes would you want us to respond? Um, as, as I know you're on the time. As okay, okay. Okay, you'll tell us when, 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 when we must stop uh, pontificating too much. Um, so, yeah. No, no, I think, thanks, Chen. Hopefully you can, you can hear me okay, because I think it looks like you're freezing on my side. So hopefully that's not uh, on my part. Um, hi, Chair, can you hear me? Matthew, the chairperson, um, no longer on the platform. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, sorry, sir. We just, I lost, 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 lost you for a second. Apologies, Chair. Um, no, just, just to run to it. Um, 
Look, I think so. Quite a few questions. I think to, to thanks members for the questions. Um, I think to, to Honourable Sheikh Imam. Um, no, look, sure. We want to appreciate. You know, members of Parliament have dependents. They have costs, etc. Um, but I think we should, we should bear a bit, a bit of context. I think those challenges facing the workers are much greater. You know, migrant workers who leave Transkei and visit the families once a year at Christmas for two weeks and live in horrendous conditions. Um, you know, you have nurses and police officers who barely earn enough to pay income tax, who can't afford to have houses. So when you have low inflation increases for public servants, we are plunging them to absolute debt and poverty. Um, I think first we do need to engage in the fiscal leakages. That's the fundamental route to rebuilding the state. So these are not easy interventions. So it's about dealing with the issue of corruption, waste of expenditure. That means treasury has to be much more strict and parliament too must be much more strict on offending departments. We have seen some progress on the SIU front, beginning to tackle corruption, beginning to see people appearing before court, but we need to see the judiciary moving with speed and the NPA coming with uh, concrete cases. Um, of course, we need to do the, do the issue of rebuilding ESCOM, Transit, PRASA, SOEs and local government. Those are the things that are going to help stimulate the economy. Um, investing in public services that helps to grow the economy and so forth. And you can see if you invest in SARS, it begins to, 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 re, to generate the profit, not the profits, the revenue the state needs to, to rebuild it. Um, I think to Honorable Nklanguini, because she made a similar point, I think for, for us is not to, to become despondent. One appreciates that you're not going to have overnight changes in parliament. You know, we, we know when we come here, you're not going to all of a sudden make huge changes. But I think it's about having the discussions, having the conversation. Um, we can see some positive impacts. For example, the SOD grant has been extended. It is a foundation for a BIG. The presidential promise stimulus has been a useful intervention. We need to see how can we further extend it. Or even the ESCOM debt relief package, that's been a useful discussion that's been taking place. We need to do much more to hold departments accountable. Um, that you know means calling offending provincial or local governments or SOEs to account, not just to the NCOP or to SCOPA, but to all committees. Um, it really is quite a, you know, a failure, as members are saying that since 2004, under the Mbeki administration, we have been discussing about eradicating the school sanitation backlog. We're still having it. You have police stations in Limpopo, who don't have proper buildings, but they, have, uh, they, they work in prefabs or windy houses. Um, you have reports of university students sleeping in libraries. Uh, there was an article today about a pregnant woman sleeping on the floor of a hospital. Um, before the strikes, you know? So I think there is huge issues. Um, and I think that, you know, we appreciate the spirit that kind of, you know, Sheikh Imam and Alman Klangwini raised that all of us must make a contribution, be it as members of parties, of MPs, departments, civil society unions, et cetera, the media. Um, so from Kosado, so that's been our approach. We engage with all parties, irrespective of the color of the T-shirt. Yes, we analyze the ANC, but we recognize all MPs have a role to play. Uh, there's enough that should unite us. Um, you know, the issue that unions have to do, we do do training for work, workers, for shop stewards all the time in the laws, labor laws, et cetera. We even do training for workers in factories about how to intervene when a company starts to bleed and go under financial pressure. We've had huge engagement with government on the public procurement issues, including the public procurement bill. I would know that members of SAMU raised their bell on the VBS corruption and two were assassinated. We've had many members being dismissed in other provinces, Kaoteng, assassinated, um, suspended in Western Cape, Kazakhstan, et cetera, or dismissed. Um, but I think just on the issue of the, the police uh, detectives' dockets, well, if you look at the second adjustment appropriation bill, the additional allocation given to detectives, we've got a huge backlog, is an additional 126 million rand, that's good. But the allocation given to the VIP protection unit for members of the executive, was twice that, 257 million rand additional monies. So we think we need to be saying, what can we do to begin to prioritize our expenditure that it really goes to where it's needed and not where it's really a luxury item. I think to Honorable Matafa, I'll try to be quick chair. Um, look, local government has many challenges. One is the capacity, the lack of qualified senior management. Um, someone wouldn't sit in those kind of senior management panels per se, but I think there is a role for treasury, for COGDA, which has been quite silent even DPSA to say, what are the minimum criteria to become a CFO, a municipal manager, manager for utilities, et cetera. Um, there's the issue of corruption and so forth, which you often just see, and we do nothing about it as a society and, and local government. Um, I think so we do need to have a discussion and rather to begin it now than it's too late 
Um, it's already getting very late. We have 90% of municipalities in financial distress. Um, we can't sustain 257 municipalities. It's, it's time we begin to discuss say, how do we begin to consolidate towards district development models. Uh, but if you have a municipality like the Zobotla having a, a budget shortfall of 50% every month besides the grants, um, and if you look at all these 27 municipalities who don't pay salaries, they also don't pay electricity. So they're really, they're dying. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion on the SOD grant, and I think as Kosato, we didn't raise it today because we felt it was under the appropriations bill, but I mean, we have supported the SOD grant. It's a huge progressive poverty alleviation intervention. Um, there's not money which is lost. It helps people to, to survive, to buy a loaf of bread. It's money that stimulates the local economy. But with concern, Chair, that you know, it's good has been extended, we wanted to continue to be extended as a foundation for BIG, but it needs to be adjusted for inflation. It hasn't been since 2020. Let's raise it to the poverty line, the food poverty line rather. Um, let's also see how can we link its recipients, the 8 million or so, to skills and employment opportunities. And perhaps we need a discussion to see how to begin to link all of these employment um, and social grant programs to see how can we consolidate them and make sure everybody, that no one is left behind. Um, but it is a very positive intervention, Chair. Um, I think, Chair, just to, to my former Free State Provincial Chairperson, Honorable Praiso, um, so we, we've highlighted where we saw budget cuts to municipalities um, per province, cuts which were below, were just actual complete cuts, quite significant ones, and then also cuts which were in real terms because they're below inflation. Um, similar with some of the departments too, like basic education, um, home affairs at, at a national level and so forth. Um, those, are, those are quite worrying, Chair. Um, I think the one difficulty around the issue of rollover is that the budget buries those kind of information deep inside. Um, obviously, perhaps for, for public consumption purposes, it would be helpful if the Treasury took a more transparent approach to, to the budget to say, this is the, the amount of money lost to or not spent, you know, rollovers. Also to highlight trends, because you'll see many departments when it comes to November, December, January, the last quarter, last two months, there's huge amounts of fiscal dumping. You know, department will sit and you'll see by the medium term budget, 7 October, Average department expenditure is about 40%, yet we're halfway through the year. After Christmas, it's, it's fiscal dumping, and then you're not going to get value for money. There's going to be significant amounts of leakages, et cetera. I don't think we've done enough, Chair, just to be honest with you, um, around as unions to kind of try to tackle this. You know, of course, there's a management function, it's a supply chain function, but I think we could do more to raise the spotlight. Um, but we have been having a lot of engagement with government around procurement, especially around supporting uh, preferential procurement, local procurement, uh, supporting SMEs to get paid within 30 days. So the 27 municipalities we highlighted in our presentation, which are owing workers, most of them also owe SMEs too. And again, it's a, there's a strong uh, correlation. I think Chair, just to Honorable Nklangwini around the ghost workers. So obviously it's difficult for any of us to know how many ghost workers are where, uh, but we think, and I think the example of Prasa with, with a small staff complement of about, I think 17,000, if I'm right, had 3,000 ghost posts. Um, I th we feel that it'd be, it can be equally significant in many of your rural municipalities, uh, many municipalities in the former homelands, or many of the departments of some of our most uh, poorly performing provinces. And I think it's not a difficult thing to simply say as parliament, we instruct all departments within six months to have a physical headcount verification process. That's not a difficult thing. Um, and then you begin to weed out issues. But even if you could find, for example, a 1% ghost post amount, that would be a huge amount of revenue you can save the state. And also then you can then fill the vacancies with actual warm bodies to provide the actual services that you need. Um, so I think also Honorable Montlanguini asked about, does Parliament have the power to, to amend the budget? Um, yes, it does, under the Monies Act. Um, it has got the power. So we understand that you won't want a free for all. We don't want a kind of political paralysis you see in the United States Congress. That's a worse exa example, extreme, but we would say that it would be a right approach, a progressive one to say for parliament, we think that we need to you know, expand the SOT grant allocation, which was cut from 44 billion rand in October of last year to 36 billion rand this year. You know, or the presidential plumbing initiative, which was cut from 24 billion rand in February last year to 9 billion rand this year. I think for us, even if we just made those two examples, that would be a huge poverty um, alleviation intervention. It wouldn't break the fiscus, which we don't want. 
Um, I think it would be useful also to say to members, um, you know, to propose to members that to ask Treasury to explain why did you put these municipalities with below inflation increases, these ones with, with actual cuts, et cetera? Because um, often there could be a legitimate reason. You know, for example, then George has been a huge amount of investment in water infrastructure. That can be a once off intervention. But when you see a lot of these cuts, it looks more like it's simply about um, trying to squeeze um, to save money for the debt. But there's going to be consequences in terms of municipal capacity, as, as Honorable Matafa is saying. I think, lastly, Chair, just to, to Honorable Schenge's questions. Um, I think we, we, I mean, we're glad you're raising the issue of localization. Um, that really is the way to grow the economy. Um, you can't simply depend upon foreign investment or other people to save us. It's about taking our money, investing it. So we've had lots of engagement with government, with Treasury, with DTIC. Um, the public procurement bill is about one trillion rand a year. That's a huge injection to the economy. You find many departments don't bother to support local procurement. You know, the Department of Health buys medication overseas. A lot of our unions like SAC to the Clothing Workers Union um, actually go door to door to departments to say when you buy clothing or textile materials, make sure it goes to a local factory. We've had a lot of engagement with different departments. Um, so the sector actually would monitor the, the government tender uh, database. And when they see such tenders, they would actually phone local factories to say, please apply for this tender because this is the way to grow jobs. It benefits workers, it benefits companies, it benefits the state as well. Um, that's a real solution. We are having lots of engagement with, we had good engagement chair with the public procurement bill, which will come to, an, uh, to parliament. It really is going to help a huge way to require all of the state institutions to support localization, um, especially after the disastrous constitutional court case, which um, disempowered Treasury to an extent. I think Chair, just to the last two questions um, which you raised, but do, Kusata, do all of Kosata members pay for municipal services? I think Kosata members would be like the rest of society, would all be guilty to different extents. So some would, the majority would, but I'm sure there are many who don't. And that speaks to need to change our billing system, as you were mentioning. Um, it can't be sustainable that 60% of society, residents, communities, departments, et cetera, um, pay in advance for electricity and the other 40% pay when they feel like it because that puts ESCOM in a crisis. It means ESCOM loses 20 billion rand a year and then it needs a better from the state, et cetera. So we have to all move towards prepaid. Um, you can't sustain anything if you don't do it that way. It means we must have some hard conversations. You might have to have a phased in, but it has to happen. Otherwise, society will collapse and is not sustainable. Um, I think, I mean, yeah, I think the other last question you raised about Chwani and Joburg, the billing issues. I mean, again, that points to a need. And I think there is some interventions in this budget and I think ongoing around the financial management systems that Treasury does. One hope that that will address the issues. Because again, if you don't do that, you will also collapse those municipalities. And I think the fact that you have 